lighthouse in the middle of the National Forest was a sight to behold. A relic of the past, its weather-worn stone walls and towering structure stood defiantly against the elements, surrounded by the beauty of the dense forest that stretched as far as the eye could see. History whispered through the aged bricks, telling tales of ships guided safely by its light in years gone by. As the park ranger Jenna arrived at the lighthouse, she was met with an eerie sense of quietude. The air felt charged with anticipation, as if something was waiting to reveal itself. However, upon initial inspection, everything seemed normal. Jenna explored the lighthouse, climbed the winding stairs to its peak, and marveled at the breathtaking views. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the forest, Jenna decided to spend the night in the lighthouse before returning to the main base in the morning. She made herself comfortable, feeling a mix of excitement and apprehension about the prospect of spending a night alone in the historic structure. As night enveloped the forest, Jenna lit a small lantern and settled in for the night. However, the tranquility was short-lived. Whispers danced through the air, almost imperceptible at first, but soon growing louder and more unsettling, knocking echoed through the walls, as if an unseen presence demanded attention at the lighthouse's door. Jenna approached the door cautiously, heart pounding in her chest. She opened it, but there was no one in sight. The forest outside seemed to be swaying with a life of its own, yet there was no human presence to explain the eerie sounds. She felt like she was being watched, the sensation of discomfort intensifying with each passing moment. Determined to uncover the source of the eerie occurrences, Jenna continued her exploration of the lighthouse. She ventured into the basement, guided only by the flickering light of her lantern. The air felt heavy and oppressive, as if the walls themselves held secrets of their own. As she opened the basement door, Jenna gasped in horror. There, stumbling and waddling before her, was a creature like nothing she had ever seen before. Its ghastly appearance was enough to make her stomach churn, and its vacant, hollow eyes sent shivers down her spine. The creature was tall, impossibly so, and disturbingly skinny, as if it had emerged from the depths of a nightmare. Without warning, the creature lunged at Jenna, its disfigured jaw opening wide with a haunting scream. In a moment of terror, Jenna's world went black, as the creature overpowered her. When Jenna woke the next day, the sun was shining, and everything appeared to be back to normal. The eerie occurrences had ceased, leaving her bewildered and questioning her own sanity. Had it all been a vivid dream, or had she truly encountered a malevolent presence within the lighthouse's walls? Growing up, I'd always been a curious and imaginative child. I was about six or seven years old at the time, and like most kids, I would occasionally wake up in the middle of the night feeling scared or uneasy. This particular night was no different, and I found myself wide awake, the darkness of my room feeling heavier than usual. Seeking comfort, I decided to head to my parents' room. Their door was shut, and for reasons I couldn't explain, I didn't dare open it. Instead, I sat down in the hallway on my beloved Garfield pillow, feeling a strange sense of unease in the dimly lit corridor. As I sat there, trying to make sense of my sudden fear, I saw something that sent chills down my spine. A figure emerged from the darkness, walking into the middle of the hallway. It was black darker than anything I had ever seen, as if it were made of an impossibly deep abyss. The other figure was mostly humanoid but its head was elongated, resembling the bird-like plague masks from centuries past. Frozen in terror, I watched as the figure stopped in the middle of the hall, and then, to my utter horror, turned to look directly at me. Its eyes were large, a haunting greenish-yellow color that seemed to pierce my very soul. The world around us seemed to stand still, the air thick, with an almost tangible sense of dread. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the figure was gone. The darkness of the hallway swallowed it whole, leaving me alone and trembling with fear. I bolted back to my bed and hid under the covers, 
hoping that whatever that thing was, it wouldn't return. To this day, I can still vividly recall the chilling encounter, the image of those haunting eyes forever etched in my memory. I don't know what it was that I saw that night, but it remains one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. Not me, but my father experienced it. It was last summer in the evening, and we lice pretty secluded. He came back later that evening and told me that he saw us five, six light balls flying in formation near his location, away from him. While doing so, they changed their formation regularly, and even though he couldn't estimate how fast they really were, at least from his view they started out slow and accelerated a lot till he lost sight. He asked me if this could have been some natural occurrence, because he said he never saw Slee like that before. My X-Files trained brain screamed UFOs. After I told my father that with a smirk grin in my face, he made me promise not to tell anybody about this, to prevent his buddies making fun of him. Man, I'm so jealous that he got to see it and not me. My husband has always been an avid outdoorsman and loves to swap stories with his friends about their adventures in the wild. I remember one evening when we were sitting by the fire and he shared a chilling tale that had been passed down to him by a close friend. As a pregnant woman with a foggy memory, I'll try my best to recount the story as it was told to me. His friend, let's call him Mark, had been an experienced hunter and was no stranger to spending nights alone in the wilderness. One autumn day, he ventured deep into the woods, hoping to bag a deer from his tree stand, a hideout spot nestled high up in the branches. As the sun began to set, Mark settled into his tree stand, waiting patiently for his prey. But as night fell, an eerie stillness settled over the forest, broken only by the occasional rustle of leaves. It wasn't long before Mark realized that he wasn't alone. From the darkness, he could hear strange noises, unlike anything he had ever encountered in his years of hunting. The sounds were guttural and menacing, sending a shiver down his spine. Paralyzed with fear, Mark could only sit there, praying that whatever was stalking him would lose interest and move on. But the creature, whatever it was, didn't leave. Instead, it stayed throughout the entire night. Its chilling presence a constant source of terror for Mark. The once brave hunter was reduced to a quivering mess, his mind racing with thoughts of what might happen if the creature decided to strike. Finally, morning arrived, and with it, a renewed sense of courage. Using the opportunity, Mark climbed down from his tree stand and sprinted back to his car, not daring to look back. He never did find out what had stalked him that night, but the experience left a lasting impression on him. As my husband finished recounting the story, I couldn't help but feel a chill run down my spine. I knew that the woods held many mysteries and unknown dangers, but this tale was a stark reminder that sometimes the most terrifying encounters are those that we cannot explain. About 10 years ago, I took my brother and friend with my two dogs quail hunting and found a trail leading from the desert up into a feeder canyon in the southern Sierra Nevada. I parked the truck at the trailhead and there were a couple of run down abandoned cabins on either side of the trail. We were all strapped with handguns and we announced ourselves and approached the cabins. One of them had a real cool old attachment shack made of rocks against the slope of the hill. None of us got any bad vibes and the dogs were fine, so we split up and started hunting. And now at one point, I started chasing a covey away from the cabins in the direction that we came. And I noticed in my peripheral vision a man with crossed arms off my left about 40 yards away. And when I did a double take, all I saw was a Joshua tree in that same spot. So I kept after me dogs and birds and I again felt someone looking at me from a different spot but on the same side of the mountain. And again when I turned, it was a Joshua tree. The real strange thing is that later that morning, I went hunting past the cabins into the canyon, and my brother was on the slope 
about 150 feet above me, looking for Chukrar. He later told me that when he saw me by the creek thicket, below him a gray mist cloud moved down the canyon and went over me and my dogs between him and me, and he said that made him feel real uneasy. Nothing else happened on the trip, but if I believed in ghosts, I would say that some miner is guarding his stash up there. I have tried to go back to that spot over the years, but the wife and kids get mad and have said that I'm going to bring back some bad mojo. If I go so, I let it be. Every summer on the way to Bishop, I look off towards the Sierras and see the haunted canyon far off in the distance. This was told to me by one of the guys who had the encounter. He and his hunting partner were hunting somewhere in Utah. I'm being vague because I don't remember exactly where, and I'm sworn to secrecy, so no identifying info. They were on horses, in the middle of nowhere in a large blind canyon, one way in, one way out. Lots of deadfall, took most of the day on horseback to get in, so to set the scene, middle of nowhere and tough country. They come upon a guy dressed in 1950s hunting apparel, standing in the middle of a deadfall that no one had any business standing in. They had rode in from the bottom and did not see any traces. They approach to make themselves friendly. Horses want nothing to do with this guy's. An air of tension is casting a pall on this whole interaction. The guy is nice enough except for the fact that he had red eyes, not pothead ripped out of his mind red, filming red eyes. Yep, red flannel in the middle of nowhere and glowing red eyes. They took their leave, both nervous. My buddy looked back at the guy, gone. Nowhere to go, but he was not there. My friend has only told this to a couple of people, and I know, it's a little anticlimactic, but at the time it scared the crap out of two grown men with rifles growing red eye dude had no rifle. My friend is sure that he met the devil himself that day. They have never been back. Hunting about 10 miles into a trail in central California near Santa Barbara for deer. It's the last morning as we are out of water and I'm tired of boiling and drinking warm water from a little spring. Didn't have a filter but wish I did watched a small buck walk up a hill and disappear into the brush. A few seconds later heard the most shrilling and blood curling scream I ever heard. Looked at my friends, and they were wide-eyed too. Sounded like a banshee or women being stabbed. Concluded it was probably a weird bird sound, and proceeded to take off running towards where I saw the buck disappear. In hopes of relocating it, and confirming it was too small to legally take right where the scream came from, found nothing, and called it quits and hiked out of there. In my city, there's this old mansion surrounded by acres of land, which is also a park. Out in the country, the frontage road main road is lined with tall palm trees for several miles, but it's all flatlands from the mansion to a main highway intersection about 15 miles. There's stories of the mansion and surrounding area being haunted so a group of us would go out there at late at night just to see if we'd see anything. So one night a bunch of us with nothing better to do go out there and drive around the park. After a while of not seeing anything, we decide to head down towards the highway. Now, it's late at night in the country and no one is on the road when all of a sudden it appears there's a car coming towards us in the opposite direction. It's not the headlights that we see, but the glare of the headlights. Like the top of the lights as if it were to come up from hill. Best way to describe it. Anyways, I turn down my high beams because I don't want to blind the other driver. When we all notice the car isn't coming closer approaching us. Since I'm driving, I'm thinking. Weird. So I speed up thinking the oncoming car will be visible. Again, this is a flat road. There's no hills, so I'm getting a little nervous that this car's headlights has not come into view. The other thing, no matter how fast or slow I was driving, that light kept the same distance. 
never getting any closer or farther. I'm getting a little freaked out, and I'm still driving fast like 60-70 miles per hour, and we are still just seeing the top of what should have been headlights. After about maybe 10 minutes, the light disappears, so we think that we'll catch up to what we think is a parked car, but no. Nothing. We reached the intersection for the highway, and there was no car or anything. That road is a two-way <laughs> road grape fields on both sides, so there's no way it could have pulled off to the side. We drove back down that road to head back towards the mansion and to the city, but those car lights never appeared, and we never figured out what it was. Years ago, I lived in a forest in a tiny house with a flat roof. It might sound unbelievable, as in horror movies, but close to our house was a land with housing for people in bad mental condition. As a social worker, I'm not scared because of it at all, and I think it's really nice we were all lucky to live in the middle of beautiful nature. One night I was home alone. I drank my drink and smoked my smoke I smoke. Those days when I heard something walking over the roof of the house. First a louder boof like a jump, some weird running around, that over and over and over, I like fantasy, thrillers, splatter, sci-fi. But believe me, not when you feel like you're in the middle of that. It was hard to escape the sound. I didn't want to go outside in the deepest night, so I laid under my blanket, hoping it would stop or I would fall asleep. But I couldn't. Then I heard the blinds and realized I left my window open. I started to hear my heartbeat in my head, then some scratching behind the TV, even though my lights were still on. You kept my eyes powerfully shut. And then there was that one moment I thought. I can lay here waiting to get murdered, or at least do my best and scare back. I crawled out under my blanket, took my guitar as some sort of damaging baseball bat and shuffled towards the TV. I heard the scratching and saw water coming out under the TV table. Whatever that was behind the TV was about to get squished between the wall and my guitar. I did a Conan, the barbarian pose, and pressed the guitar behind my TV to be shocked with the most terrible scream ever. I froze. And there he was. A big fat red cat finally flew next to my head, towards the blinds straight out of the window. I never knew I could be this retarded. They should have brought me to the land for people in bad mental condition. My husband's extended family lives in New Brunswick, while his parents moved to Ontario and raised their kids here. Eventually, my in-laws retired back to New Brunswick, about 1,400 kilometers away. So, my husband's maternal grandmother was sick for a while. His parents got the call one night that she had taken a turn for the worse and to come right away. They literally packed and left Ontario right away and were driving down across an old, old logging highway in the middle of New Brunswick. See my older post for a short gif of the desolate road. When a moose ran out onto the road and reared in front of their car, they restopped the car and the moose walked up to the windows and looked into the cab, literally leaving breath on the windows. Eventually it walked away. They get to the hospital in the middle of the night, only to find out that grandma passed away, exactly at that time. Fast forward 30 years, my husband's mom is terminally ill. Her kids and grandkids have convened in New Brunswick for her last days, for several days before her death. We come home from the hospital to find moose tracks in the driveway, especially around the windows of the house. My husband's cousin has to go back to Ontario and leaves the hospital to get ready. Within an hour of this, my husband's mom had passed away. Fifteen minutes after her passing, I get a text from his cousin, a picture of a moose standing beside their garage. Never before or after has anyone seen a moose in the yard. While out, hiking in the middle of the night with my friends in California, we came across a mountain lion. We were headed down the mountain, my friend at the front, another one of my friends in the middle, and myself in the back, 
The front friend suddenly stopped and asked, Did you guys hear that? I thought he was joking, but asked what? Anyway, consequently, I looked to my left off the trail and saw glowing eyes staring back at me about 15-20 feet away. I pushed the button on my headlamp to make it shine brighter and saw the silhouette of a mountain lion. We all stared at it in fear, and it stared back. Finally, I called out and raised my arms above my head. Hey lion, in an attempt to scare it away, this next part I'll never forget. It blinked exactly once, and very slowly, like how common housemate blink. Then it turned away and we couldn't see it anymore. All the way down the mountain, we shouted random things to scare it away, if it was even still following us. We even had a conversation while shouting just to keep our minds off it. Mind you, we were terrified. Remember every 20 seconds or so, I would check behind us and scan the area to see if it was following us. Also, myself and the friend in the front had our knives drawn, as if my little leather men would have made a difference in the event of an attack, knowing that mountain lions attacked their prey from behind, and with myself being in the back of the group, my friend very well could have saved my life. I like to explore, and there's some woods by my house that my neighbors gave me permission I go in. So they know I go there sometimes just to walk or to explore with friends. So there's this old bridge that somehow was knocked down, and I enjoy going there, so one day I figure I'll make a cool video edit of it. So I ride my bike to the greenway by the creek, It's and I start down it, everything is fine. I get to the fence line that's down Hoppet, he'll have permission here. So I push my bike a bit farther than unload leaving my bike hidden, with my pack not sure why hidden, but I don't want anything to happen to it. So I start to walk to the bridge with two GoPros, one on a chesty, another on a selfie stick. I get there, take some cool pictures and video. I'm finishing up and realize crap I didn't get B-roll. So I start recording again, just getting standard shots when all of a sudden I hear a truck or Audi TV pull up, which I thought was weird. Since my neighbors were not home, and it's overgrown grass lane, leading to the bridge, also you can't see the bridge from the road. And also my neighbors would have seen me enter their property. So I start to leave since I have no idea who it is. And I heard them beep all I can hear it on the video. So I hide behind a pine tree. I know smart than someone yells hey at this point, I just run to my bike and leave. I still have no idea who it was. And the last time I went back alone, I got weird feeling and left. Also, not the only strange thing that happened to me here. I was coyote hunting in the dark, maybe 3 a.m. I am not one of weak stomach, I work with pigs. I smell this rotting, disgusting, horrible smell. I find a nearby small cave and look inside. There were maybe six dead coyotes and just gore, bloody shit and body parts. None of it was human. I then heard struggled breathing and hacking coughing. Armed with a semi-automatic shotgun, I was not afraid until I saw this thing. Pasty white, hairless, ugly. It was similar to the made-up rake, but this was real. I aimed and fired twice. It was about 15 feet away. The yet recoiled and ran off, screeching as it ran. I paged a local ranger office. They sent out a recovery team and police showed up later. I was questioned and the cave was discovered and the human parts recovered. The area was locked off from public access for a while. At friend's house. Friend was in garage working on dirt bike. Driveway empty because parents left a while ago. Go inside to grab a soda but decide to look for his cat. Who I haven't seen all day. I walk into the office and as I'm calling her name. A deep man's voice goes, meow, right into my right ear. I jump and run around the main floor looking for who said that. Didn't find anyone. Late one night, as a weary trucker, I found myself taking a shortcut down an unfamiliar highway due to an unexpected detour. The road stretched on endlessly 
and an eerie sense of foreboding gnawed at me as I drove deeper into the darkness, and I knew I had to stay vigilant, for the stories of this cursed highway were whispered among truckers, and I was now amidst the very road that fueled their fears. They couldn't shake the feeling of being watched as I navigated through the ghostly stretch of road. The haunting silence was only broken by the faint hum of my truck's engine and the distant echoes of past accidents that seemed to linger in the air. My knuckles turned white as I gripped the steering wheel tighter, hoping to reach familiar ground soon. Suddenly, movement caught my eye, and I glanced out the window. There, just a few yards ahead, something crossed the road. My heart leaped into my throat as I caught sight of the cryptid that stood before me. The figure was short, about 130 centimeters, and its gaze was fixed intently upon me. Its grayish-green pallor sent shivers down my spine, and large, dark, pupil-less eyes stared into my soul. The creature's head and body were covered in heavy skin folds, giving it an appearance that was both otherworldly and ancient. The thin beard adorned its face, making it seem as if it were an elderly being, bearing the weight of countless years. To my astonishment, another figure soon emerged beside the first one. This second entity was slightly shorter and appeared younger, but they both shared a resemblance to aged gnomes. They communicated in gestures and low murmurs, and it was as if time itself had twisted around them. My heart raced, and I slammed on the brakes, bringing the truck to a screeching halt. Fear and disbelief washed over me as I struggled to comprehend what lay before my eyes. Had exhaustion in the stories of this haunted highway played tricks on my mind, but the clarity of the sight before me was undeniable. I sat frozen in my seat, my breath quickening, as I watched the two enigmatic beings. The seconds ticked by, feeling like an eternity, and then, just as mysteriously as they had appeared, they dissolved into thin air, leaving me alone on the endless road once more. My mind reeled as I tried to process the surreal encounter. Was I losing my mind, or had I truly witnessed something inexplicable? The haunted stretch of highway seemed to mock me, revealing its secrets and taking them away just as quickly. I knew I had to share my encounter, but who would believe me? After a restless night, I finally made it to my destination, my mind burdened with the weight of the inexplicable event. As days passed, I kept replaying the encounter in my mind, searching for answers in vain. It was dark. I was driving my truck going south on Highway 219 out of Hillsboro. I had the truck's bright lights on. I was scanning the countryside for wildlife, as is my practice. I've seen hundreds of deer and a number of elk over the years. Not necessarily in this location, nor should we, but what I saw that night made my mouth drop open. I saw a very tall, shaggy, golden-brown animal with two very long legs. Its arms were hugging its sides. It was standing as still as a tree as the headlights hit him. My first impression was that is the biggest deer I have ever seen in my life, Corey Emperor, even though it was looking directly into the headlights. The eyes were not reflective. It had no antlers, and as I got closer I saw that it didn't have hind legs or a horizontal body attached. It was taller than an elk and much, much taller than a white-tailed deer. I would estimate that it stood approximately eight feet tall. It had a good build well proportioned, the hair seemed to be about four inches long and covered all the body except for the eyes. The head was round on top with little or no neck. The face appeared flat and the nose was small enough not to be noticed. The hair had a slight wave to it. It did not lay flat. To tell the truth, it looked a lot like Chewbacca's pee from Star Wars. It was standing in a field about two, three pickup lengths from the road, facing the road at an angle in such a way that my headlights hit him straight on as I approached, and I could see him from the side as I passed him. It was going 55 miles per hour, so I saw him for only seconds. But the image is etched in my brain. I've thought about this since the day it happened, and can figure out nothing else that it could be other than a Sasquatch. 
I finally decided to report it. Also noticed, everything was ordinary. Here I was in such denial of what I saw that I didn't even turn the car around. But the image stayed in my mind. I drove by the field again and about an hour later, the animal was gone. Where it all began in, in the heart of Appalachia. That's where I first had the encounters that would forever change my perspective on the world. I'm not one for tall tales or flights of fancy, but what I saw, as absurd as it sounds, was real. I remember the day as clear as a bell and was walking through the woods, lost in the peaceful rhythm of nature, when I noticed a peculiar movement in my peripheral vision. As I squinted, trying to make sense of what I was seeing, my eyes landed on a small figure, no more than twelve inches tall. It was a tiny man, or so it seemed, dragging another creature by the ankle. I could barely believe what I was seeing, but there was no denying it. The creature being dragged was no ordinary critter, it was a fairy, and by the looks of it, either unconscious or worse. You know how preposterous it sounds, trust me, I've wrestled with the logic of it for years, but I saw it with my own eyes, the tiny man and the fairy, right there in the heart of Appalachia. Fast forward four years, and I found myself face to face with the unbelievable once more, where again, I was in the woods, not far from where I had the first encounter. This time, I saw fairies, a whole group of them, fluttering about, their wings shimmering under the filtered sunlight. I don't expect anyone to believe me, at least not anyone who hasn't seen it with their own eyes. Knowing this story is a risk, one that opens me up to ridicule and disbelief. Yet the truth of what I saw remains, etched in my memory. It's a secret I carry, one I can't share with the people I know in real life. They wouldn't understand, wouldn't be able to accept it, but maybe, just maybe, there are others out there who've seen what I've seen, who know that sometimes reality is stranger than we could ever imagine. I once climbed the wrong couloir on the Middle Teton after getting bad route advice. My camera worked fine before and after entering the couloir, but when I tried to take pictures from the base, it showed only weird ghostly images of the rock with half the pixels missing. I ended up stranded alone on a ledge at 12,000, 500 feet with no sleeping bag. Search and Rescue said I was the third person they knew about soloing the route that year. One died and the other barely survived with a severe brain injury. I turned out okay, but a dude died the same night on the route I should have been on. Not sure what my camera was trying to tell me. And near where I go to school, there's a massive state park that is rumored to have an old Air Force research facility in the back corner of it. The front part is visited frequently by hikers, hunters, and whatnot. But if you wander into the back of it far enough, you find some really creepy stuff from meth heads to cults to estranged citizens. Where a couple of good ones come to mind. The ROTC program used to do field training out there once a semester and part of it is a land navigation course. That pretty much consisted of the cadets out in the woods by themselves for around five to six hours navigating the land. I've heard from multiple people they'll be walking to their next point or take a break on a tree and find human skeletons or bones. Another one that happened to me when some friends and I were hunting exploring one weekend. We were wandering through woods when we came up to a clearing. And the clearing is this old run down and almost abandoned church. We didn't really think anything of it at first, but we noticed that there were things off with it. First the cross on the steeple was upside down. Then we noticed there were no windows on the building itself at all. We were about to come out of the clearing to have a look around when the door opened to it and a man in black robes came out for a minute and then went back inside. That's when we booked it out of there. I have tons of stories of that national park. They hate going there every time we go, but the stories that come out of it are something else. First of all, I have been very reluctant to tell this story in fear of being ridiculed. 
I did send a not-so-well-written report to BFRO some years ago, and because I was in fear of being ridiculed, I did not participate in a follow-up investigation, and therefore the story was not published. I've read some other reports people have submitted and can relate. Anyway, to my story. I was driving one night in the coast range of Oregon above the small town of Falls City. I had some friends with me who will remain unidentified. We drove up the Black Rock Main Line Road and turned off onto a small dead end logging road. As I turned left going up the ridge, I noticed there were some campers in the area. There were several vehicles parked alongside of the road. There were tents and a good campfire burning with people standing around the fire. I drove past the campers slowly and turned my truck around and headed back in the direction in which I came from. As I just started towards the campers, I heard a very loud howling type scream. The sound came from my left and behind me, down the hill, not from the area of the camp. The pitch of the scream was from low to high as I recall. The scream was very loud as I heard it over the volume of my stereo, which in fact was quite loud at the time. The scream seemed to go on for some time, maybe as long as four or six seconds. We all were scared. The old expression of the hair raising up on the back of your neck is actually true and exactly what happened in this case. I drove out of the area SAP. One of my friends and I returned the following day during daylight. Even being there during the day gave me the creeps. The campers were gone. I did not get out of the truck and drove out of the area. I have been back to the area a few times over the years, initially to show people the area and during deer hunting season. I will not forget that night. Certainly I cannot say it was a Bigfoot, however it was a sound that was totally unnatural to humans. A sound I had never heard before and hoped to never hear again. I saw the Mothman as it flew over my school bus, and I think it was winter of 1966. The school bus driver, Odell Wallace and I, were the last ones on the bus, as we had already dropped off all the other kids and were headed toward the end of the school bus route on Big 16 Mile Creek in Mason County. I lived another mile past that. I would walk in the morning to the bus and home from it in the evening and it flew over the bus and was no more than 100 feet above us, and we could see that the wingspan of this thing was about the length of the bus. And after it flew over, I looked up into the mirror that the driver used to watch the kids as he drove. He was looking back at me and I said, did you see that? He just looked at me and nodded, and nothing else was said. I haven't told too many people about this for fear of ridicule and joking bull, but now I'm 65 years old and I don't care what anybody says. I know what I saw was not anything normal. I'm a hunter also. Deer hunter, rabbit, squirrel, groundhog, or anything else I can eat that doesn't have antibiotics and human footprints in it. And I've never before seen anything like it, and not since, even though I'm always in the woods. So I know that the dang thing existed, or still exists. I saw something 10 years ago in Los Angeles. It's an experience that I'll never forget. Back then, I was working a temp job that required me to park my car in an underground garage. At first, it was just like any other job. I worked there for several months without incident. But one day, something happened that changed everything. It was around 9 a.m., and I was driving into the garage like I always did. But as I was driving, something caught my eye to the left of me. At first, I thought it was just a trick of the light. But as I turned to take a better look, I realized it was something else entirely. There, standing before me, was a human-like figure that was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It was massive, eight or nine feet tall, maybe even taller. But what was truly strange was the fact that it had no facial features and no limbs. Instead, it was made of brownish smoke that was swirling ferociously and moving towards me. Not walking, but simply swirling and moving forward. I was frozen in terror. I couldn't move, couldn't look away. I felt like I was being pulled towards the figure, like it had some kind of strange hold on me. For sure, but then, 
In a moment of clarity, I snapped out of it and realized I needed to get out of there. I quickly parked my car and ran inside the building, my heart racing and my mind reeling. The rest of the day passed in a blur. I couldn't focus on my work, couldn't shake the feeling that something was following me. And as the end of the shift approached, I knew I needed to get out of there as fast as possible. I quickly jumped in my car and started driving away, but as I looked back, I saw the figure again. It seemed to be coming towards my car, like it was following me. I felt a wave of panic wash over me. I couldn't stay there any longer. I needed to get out, to escape whatever it was that was chasing me. I exited the garage as fast as I could, my heart pounding in my chest, and then once I was outside, I drove away as quickly as I could. That was the last time I ever went to that building. The next morning, I quit my job and never looked back. Even now, ten years later, I still can't explain what I saw that day. Was it some kind of ghost or apparition? Was it just my imagination playing tricks on me? I'll never know for sure. But one thing's for certain. I'll never forget that experience. And I'll always be grateful that I was able to get away from whatever it was that was chasing me. My whole family and I were camping at the Malala River. We set up camp near mile marker 7. Our campsite was right on the river. While taking a drive, we noticed some trees twisted and broken in the forest, and we thought nothing about it at the time. We just wondered. Then, even farther up the road, we pulled off of the main road and found some other people at a campsite and my parents were chatting with them. Then my parents headed back to our car and said that we can get out and play around because they weren't done talking. Then we heard the people saying that they were Bigfoot researchers and they showed us photographs that they had that were taken at that very campsite and they were also beating the trees with baseball bats. They also gave my mom a book or card or something. I can't remember. Well, from here on, my memory somewhat runs together, but I know it happened over about three days. The first night we noticed something. We heard two screams. Also described below, one was coming from the river, just down the hill from us. That night we had some spaghetti. Well, I'll bring this back up later. My dad reassured us it was just a cougar and that we should go back to sleep. And then we all heard something walk past our tent on the gravel. And then we heard clanking and rummaging through our things near the kitchen. My mom didn't wash dishes. The next morning, we went down to the river, and we found our spaghetti sauce spoon near the riverbed clean. Our stuff was also all strewn around. Whether or not it was a Sasquatch, I am not sure. Also, we saw a track in the mud on the trail to the river, and we took a picture of it next to a tape measure. I can't remember the measurement or where it went. I'm estranged from my mother now, so I am not sure if she still has it. This is the main sighting. Next. My sister Marianne and I were sitting on some wool blankets coloring, and my mom was cooking us some dinner again. Near my sister and I there are three large trees, and I thought I saw something run behind the tree and my sister looked at me too. Then we both stared and we saw a large creature. Jason, yes Bigfoot, run behind the second tree, and a somewhat shorter and smaller one ran behind the third big tree. Believe me, I bolted to my mom, and she asked me what happened. On a funny note, it scared us so bad that my younger sister wet her pants. She then told all of us kids to get in the car. The tent wouldn't be that safe, and judging by the twisted trees, the car didn't seem that safe either when I looked back on it. I ran to the car, and I looked in the trees, and there was one of the Bigfoots crouching in the bushes, just staring at my mom scared the hell out of me, and from this day, this sighting is still really vivid in my mind, and it still gives me goosebumps. My younger brother, he was only about four, ran to our tent and brought back a BB gun, and then the Bigfoot turned around and bolted in the woods on its two feet. When my dad came back that day a few hours later, he was dark. He found us all sitting in the car. I think we left the next day.
I was driving with Edwin Pratt, who was 58, on our way to a farm when we witnessed something peculiar. An orange glow descended from the sky, causing our car to shudder and shake uncontrollably. We careened off the road and onto a grass verge to the right, where we came to a stop, where headlights were now four times their normal intensity. Just 15 feet in front of us was a glowing orange cigar-shaped object that was 15 feet long and hovering just 12, 18 inches above the grass. It had a window at the top left, through which we could see the heads of three men. Suddenly, a man emerged from the object, but we saw no door open. He walked towards our car, which was now still shaking, even as he approached. The man was about six feet tall, slim, and was dressed in a silvery one-piece suit that looked like aluminum foil, complete with a seam or zipper down the front. He wore no helmet, and his skin was pale, with long blonde hair and a dark beard. As he bent over and looked into the car, we noticed that he had a long, sharp, pointed nose and piercing pink eyes that resembled those of a rabbit. To our surprise, the car's engine spontaneously started. After about two minutes, the man moved to the back of the car and disappeared from view. The object had vanished by this point, and the car behaved normally afterwards. In fact, it even performed better than before the incident. actually live about 35 minutes from Point Pleasant, West Virginia and a little town called Ripley. I have friends in Point that have had some pretty messed up encounters driving through the McClintic Wildlife Preserve. That's where the area they call TNT is located. There are these old ammunition storage bunkers that look like giant igloos and some old worn down and deserted factories. Talk about one hell of a creepy ass place, my buddy Brian said. He and two friends were out there back in 2002 driving around the maze of back roads when they heard something hit the roof of the truck. And when they looked out the back glass, they could see what looked like a person hanging gliding behind them. It was very dark, and they could only make out the outline. He said it followed them, and kept hitting the roof for about a mile. They were losing their minds with fear the whole time. The thing was keeping up with them even when they were doing 70 plus in a couple spots. He said he'll never forget that night, and I know he wouldn't make something like that up. He's a very devoted Christian and churchgoer. The night was painted in eerie crimson as we arrived in the small European village. The rare lunar event, known as the Red Moon, hung heavily in the sky, casting an ominous glow over everything. We were an elite Navy SEAL team, dispatched in response to a sudden surge of brutal attacks and mysterious deaths in the village. The locals whispered that the Red Moon had awakened ancient predators, such as werewolves and wendigos, that had long been dormant in the surrounding forests. Our mission was clear, protect the village and eliminate the threat. We fortified the village, employing every tactic and weapon at our disposal. Yet, as the first howls echoed through the still night air, we understood that our military training had not prepared us for this. The cryptids were cunning, a deadly cat and mouse game ensuing as we attempted to hunt them down. They were unlike any enemy we had ever faced, creatures of nightmare and legend brought to life by the chilling light of the red moon. During our pursuit, we discovered an ancient artifact hidden within a nearby cave. It was a relic from a bygone era, pulsating with a power that seemed to resonate with the cryptids. We soon realized that this artifact held the ability to control these creatures, a revelation that opened our eyes to a far greater threat. The sinister cult, shrouded in the darkness of the forest, sought to harness this power. They planned to use the red moon and the artifact to awaken and control the predators for their own dark purposes. The stakes were suddenly far higher than we could have imagined. We were not just fighting for the survival of a village, but the entire world. We devised a plan to secure the artifact and defeat both the cult and the cryptids. It was a dangerous gambit, one that pushed us to our limits and beyond. We fought through the night, the eerie glow of the red moon casting long shadows 
as we engaged in a desperate battle against the cult and the fearsome cryptids. The air was thick with the scent of blood and fear, and we could hear the snarls and howls of the creatures as they closed in on us. With the artifact in our possession, we could feel its power surging through us, urging us to take control of the cryptids. But we knew that the price of such power was too high, that we could not allow ourselves to become like the cult that sought to exploit it. Instead, we used the artifact to weaken the connection between the cryptids and the Red Moon, disrupting the cult's control over them. As we fought our way through the cult's ranks, we were forced to confront the very essence of darkness that they worshipped. But we held strong, our resolve unwavering, and with each member of the cult we defeated, we drew closer to ending their twisted plans. Finally, as dawn broke on the horizon and the Red Moon's grip on the world began to fade, we emerged victorious. The cult was dismantled, their dark purpose thwarted. The cryptids, now free from the influence of the artifact and the Red Moon, retreated into the depths of the forest, their primal rage subsiding. We had accomplished our mission, protecting the village and preventing global chaos. Yet, the experience had left its mark on each of us, a reminder of the darkness that lurked just beyond the boundaries of our understanding. As we left the village behind, we knew that we had witnessed something truly extraordinary, a glimpse into a world where the line between myth and reality was blurred as we returned to our normal lives. The memory of that fateful night under the Red Moon remained etched in our minds, a testament to the strength and courage of those who dare to face the unknown. And though we could not predict what other mysteries lay waiting in the shadows, we knew that we would be ready to confront them when the time came. I'll start out by saying that the small town where I grew up and where all of my family still resides is in Monroe County, Ohio, maybe 20 minutes or so, outside of Wheeling, West Virginia. I was talking to my dad on the phone the other night. He told me that last week while driving home from work, he came across something he can't explain. His voice was shaky, unlike I have ever heard him. He works the night shift at a local coal mine and while driving home from work early one morning around 5.30 a.m., he noticed a large creature crouched down in the road. It had bright red glowing eyes that looked directly at him. He said this creature also had very large wings which were wrapped around it as it crouched. He said he had never in his life seen anything like this. It had really upset him. He proceeded to drive by it, but when he looked behind him, it was gone. He said, that he was actually scared to get out of his car when he got home in fear, that perhaps it had followed him or was even in his car. For a few very tense minutes, he slowly got out of the car. There was nothing there. I asked him if he had ever heard of the Mothman. He kind of paused, then said that he had never heard of it until he started talking to people about what he had seen. He said that they would say right away, it sounds like you saw the Mothman. You hear weird stories all the time, and because you don't really know the person who witnessed it, you just shrug it off. Knowing my dad, and what a logical thinker he is, I believe he encountered something supernatural. He is usually the one who tries to come up with logical answers for things that are otherwise unexplained. He's very skeptical when it comes to aliens, UFOs, ghosts, etc. For me to talk to him and hear him tell me about this Mothman-like creature was shocking for this is not like my father. I will say that I am concerned, for what I understand is that when a person actually witnesses a Mothman, oftentimes bad things happen afterward. There isn't a doubt in my mind that what he saw was 100% true. It has completely made a believer out of me when it comes to the Mothman. I hope for the sake of my father and my family that that isn't true and that he made a mistake of identity. Or if you've been deep woods camping all alone out, is the emptiness that is what is creepy. No car horns, or engine noise, chatter or children, neither hustle or bustle, just the wind and the quiet at night, 
Leaves don't rustle in the calm and sticks don't crack in the absence of the weight of someone or something coming and going. Just pure quiet. You look up at the sky and see an ocean of stars, sometimes flickering, and realize that millions of people can't see them because of city lights or pollution. There is no common connection being had unless you gaze at the moon, and even then the doubts cloud your mind, and it's two days to hike to the nearest landmark, and you aren't sure if you want to head back because you aren't sure if the world has ended, and you are the last person alive. You strain your senses to hear, to see, to touch another person, but they are all gone. They're all gone. And I've always loved the forest. It's where I feel most at home. That's why I became a park ranger, to protect and preserve these lands. But one day, something strange happened. I was walking along the forest trail, keeping an eye on things like I usually do when I saw a group of men in black suits walking towards me. They had no park ranger uniforms, but they had badges and ID cards that identified them as some kind of government agents. They said they were conducting a routine investigation and asked me to show them around. At first, I didn't think much of it. I figured they were just here to check on the animals or the trees or something like that. But as I watched them work, something about their behavior started to bother me. They were searching for something, something elusive, something unknown, and they weren't telling me what it was. I asked them what they were looking for, and they told me it was just a routine check, but I knew they were lying. They were hiding something sinister, and I was determined to find out what it was. One night, I decided to follow them. They were searching for something deep in the woods, something that made my blood run cold. I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. A low growl, almost like an animal, but something more. Something inhuman. I confronted them, demanding to know what they were doing. That's when they turned on me. They threatened me with jail time if I didn't back off. They said I was interfering with the government investigation, and that I had no right to be here. But I couldn't back down. I couldn't let them find whatever it was they were looking for, so I kept following them, watching them from the shadows, as the days went on, their behavior grew more and more erratic. They stopped sleeping, stopped eating, stopped doing anything but searching for that thing in the woods. And as they got closer, I could feel something dark and sinister looming over us, something that had been sleeping for far too long. Finally, one night, they found it. I don't know what it was, but it was huge, with eyes that glowed like fire in the dark. They tried to catch it, to contain it, but it was too powerful. It broke free from their grasp and chaos erupted. I ran as fast as I could, but I could hear their screams echoing through the forest, a sound that still haunts me to this day. I don't know what they unleashed, but I know it was something far beyond our understanding, something that should have stayed hidden in the darkness. Now I'm afraid to go back to the forest. I can't shake the feeling that something is watching me, waiting for me, and I know that those men in black, they were hiding something that should never have been found, something that will haunt me forever. I lived in a fairly secluded area, only four or five other houses on a five mile road. My brother, a few friends, and I played in the woods a lot during summer breaks from school. One summer, we spent countless hours building a house in the woods out of sticks and rocks. Truthfully, it was a decent house. We got stuck in a heavy rainstorm and were able to take shelter in it and only got mildly damp. School started up again, so we stopped playing in our house. But one day, just after the first snowfall, my brother and I decided to go back to our house and see if it was still standing. We got close. I noticed that a few things had been moved, but just assumed it was animals or wind or something. When we got right up to it, and were able to see inside, it was clear that something, or someone, had been inside, possibly for a decent amount of time. We do have bears and other wildlife around, but this was clearly something with the ability to design a living space. The space was cleared to sleep with leaves for padding, and there was a makeshift table made out of a large flat rock that had been carried buried. We looked at each other, 
and headed back home quickly, maybe half a mile or better. We never talked about it after that, and we didn't mention it to our parents, but I never went back there, and always took someone with me if I went into the woods after that. Apparently, when I was younger, like barely able to speak, I was sitting on the floor playing with some toys nonchalantly with my mom when I just said, when I was in heaven, I met a woman who said you'd be the perfect mommy for me. I apparently held the belief that I was in heaven before being born, and an angel looked at me and chose the mom I went to. My mom asked me to describe the woman, and I apparently described my mom's great-grandmother perfectly, down to the eye color. I had never met my great-great-grandmother, nor seen a picture of her. As a child visiting my grandma's house, my mom's mom. Whenever I left the house, I'd wave next door to Ken, who was always sat in the bay window, looking out at the sea. They lived right on the coast off the North Sea in Hartlepool. We'd never really talk, but just a little wave before I went to get into the car. One time, I'm leaving my gran's house. I'm in front of my mom, who stopped at the door to talk to my gran. So I head down the steps and towards the gate. I turn back and see Ken in the window, big smile as usual waving at me. I give him a wave back. He stands up, gives me the thumbs up, and wanders towards the back of the room. My mum comes walking down the steps and asks, who are you waving at? I replied, Ken, this day, I can remember my mom's face. He just went white, but didn't say anything to me. So it was only a few weeks later when she plucked up the courage to tell me that Ken had died a few days prior to our visit to my grands. I don't believe in ghosts, but I know I saw him. I can still picture his striped gray sweater with light stripes across it, him waving and getting up out of his chair. There was no one else in the house. He lived by himself. Brains are weird. Update one. Sorry for the delay in getting back. But I had an update from my mom regarding me seeing Ken. I reminded her of the incident and what she can remember of it. I got this reply. I'm sure you saw him too. I know there's someone in our house. Ashley, mom's cat, sees them on the stairs the same time every night if we are in the lounge. I always say hello. Definitely doesn't feel like a threatening presence though. So now it turns out there's not just Ken next door. There's someone in my mom's house. Maybe it's my gran. Once pandemic is over, I'll have to stay over a few nights to see for myself. Graveyard shift security at a hotel casino. We got called to the top floor of the hotel because people from the floor below were calling in noise complaints. I was the FNG, so I had a trainer with me when we went up. Dispatch told us over the radio that there was nobody registered on that floor. So cool. Just a few idiots being idiots. We got up there and every single door on the entire floor was wide open. Anyone who has been to these hotels knows that you can't just accidentally leave the doors open because they closed by themselves. They weren't propped open or anything, just open. We asked dispatch if engineering was doing any work up here or had anything going on during the day. After a few minutes, they told us they called engineering, and they said no. We just noped out at that point and said there was nobody up there. My sister has been a nurse for about eight years in Southern, and now Northern California. Worked in hospitals and surge, tele-ICU, dialysis centers, and now a hospice nurse. She has a few stories from the hospital. Things like children laughing, shadows, patients claiming they saw another dead patient when they had never met. One of the creepiest that she and the other nurses told me was about a patient complaining and scared that something was under their bed. He was older and confused, so they didn't think much of it. I checked on him, responded to the multiple calls, and just tried to make him feel better. The next day, a new patient went into that room, another older person but not confused, and called to complain about something under his bed. 
They sort of brushed it off again after checking. The next night, a new patient in his 20s and completely coherent called crying that something kept running under his bed. They checked and found nothing, but the patient was in such distress and shaking, they moved him. Who happened quite a few other times as well. They never found anything but that was so creepy to me. Not sure if this is paranormal or not, but we live together now, and she works as a hospice nurse. Every so often, she would scream or I'd hear her struggle or make weird noises in the middle of the night. I'd go to check and she'd tell me it was sleep paralysis and explain what happened, that she saw a specific patient in her episode standing over her and growling, crying, or screaming. Always a very scary dream. The next day, that patient would die. Happened about 13 times so far. Trips me out. On 7 July, my friend Glennon and I were at the campground on the Malala River when we stumbled upon a torn apart gunny sack that had been hung off the ground with potatoes scattered on the ground. We suspected that a local had been baiting Bigfoot in the area. We had been in the same area back in March, but on the North Fork of the Mala River, when we heard a scream around 8-9 p.m. and encountered a strong smell. Later that night, around 10 p.m., we heard another scream in the distance and a couple of thuds that we couldn't identify around 2 a.m. Our dog started going crazy at our camp on a gravel ridge. Could it be more Bigfoot activity? I wasn't sure, so I contacted Steve Williams. Investigator Steve Williams looked into some recent reports from the lower Malala River area and filed a report about the coal incident of Gevyui. Around 18 July, he crossed the Pine Creek Bridge and drove about two, three miles to the gate. About two miles later, he encountered a sour smell that almost knocked him over, but saw nothing. He continued two more miles to a three-way intersection before returning to the area of the smell to investigate further. He hiked in the direction of the smell, and, about 50 yards from the road, encountered the largest black bear he had ever seen. It was the size of a zoo grizzly, and was tearing a stump apart. They stared at each other for a moment, and despite having a camera, Steve backed up several steps and did what he wasn't supposed to do. Ran like hell. He said that if the bear had stood up, it would have been seven feet tall. Steve said the bear shook its head a few times, back and forth like a dog, then turned and went in the opposite direction. Continuing his investigation of a report from me on 7 July in this report, Steve traveled about two miles up Copper Creek and found the campsite it had referred to earlier. It was located about in one-eighth of the mile in the woods past a rock quarry. He was of the opinion that a camper had hung the potatoes to keep them from critters, but had not hung them high enough, and animals had gotten to them anyway while he was there. He heard noises and met two fellows from the BLM with recording gear, and such that were looking for evidence of owls. There had been reports of screeching at night around there, owls or Bigfoot. I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement as I read the report of Joe Robb and his wife's discovery near the Nihalem River. As a Bigfoot enthusiast, this was the kind of news I lived for. I immediately contacted Joe to see if I could join him on his next expedition, and to my delight, he agreed. We planned to meet up the following weekend and spend a few days in the area helping to catch a glimpse of these elusive creatures. I packed all of my equipment and supplies, including my trusty camera and binoculars, and made my way to the coast range. When I arrived, Joe greeted me warmly and introduced me to his wife. They showed me the tracks they had found, and I was amazed at the size and depth of them. We spent the first day exploring the area, taking note of any broken trees or dug up earth. It was clear that something big had been moving through the area, and we were determined to find out what it was. As the sun began to set, we set up camp near the river. We built a fire and cooked our dinner, all the while keeping an eye out for any signs of movement. 
We talked late into the night, sharing stories of our own encounters and speculating about what we might find in the coming days. The next morning, we woke early and set out on foot to follow the tracks. We trekked through the dense forest, taking care not to disturb the environment or the creatures we were hoping to find. We came across more tracks and broken trees, and I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe at the power of these creatures. As the day wore on, we heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps nearby. We stopped in our tracks and listened intently, and that's when we saw it. A large, hairy creature stepped out from behind a tree and stared at us with a mixture of curiosity and suspicion. It was a Bigfoot, and was unlike anything I had ever seen before. The creature was massive, easily standing over eight feet tall, with long, muscular arms and legs. Its hair was dark and matted, and it had a distinct musky smell. We watched in awe as it moved through the forest, disappearing from sight just as quickly as it had appeared. Over the next few days, we continued to explore the area, catching glimpses of the creatures and gathering more evidence of their existence. We even managed to capture some footage on our cameras, although it was blurry and difficult to make out. As the expedition came to a close, I couldn't help but feel a sense of gratitude for the experience. I had always believed in Bigfoot, but now I had seen them with my own eyes. Joe and his wife had made an incredible discovery and I felt honored to have been a part of it. I packed up my gear and said my goodbyes, already looking forward to my next encounter with these amazing creatures. The vastness of the Pacific Ocean seemed endless as our U.S. Special Forces elite team embarked on a routine naval exercise. We were trained to handle a multitude of scenarios, but little did we know that the most unexpected and harrowing encounter of our lives was about to unfold. As we sailed through the calm waters, our eyes caught sight of an ominous sight on the horizon, an abandoned cargo ship drifting aimlessly. Our curiosity peaked, we decided to investigate. A sense of trepidation crept up my spine as we boarded the derelict vessel, not knowing what to expect. The ship's interior was eerie, a ghostly echo of its former activity. Dust and cobwebs covered everything, and a stifling atmosphere hung in the air. But it was not the ship's emptiness that alarmed us, it was the cargo we discovered below deck. There, in the dim light, stood a creature that defied all logic and explanation. It was taller than any of us, easily dwarfing a pickup truck by a couple of feet. Its bones were encased in a haunting contrast of black and white, long arms half stretched to its sides, as if it was daring us to challenge it. This cryptid creature was like nothing we had encountered before. Three-dimensional and imposing, it exuded an aura of deathly stillness. It seemed to absorb light around it, not reflecting anything in return. A deer skull formed its nightmarish face, void of expression yet evoking an unshakable sense of malevolence. Before we could fully process the enigma before us, the creature lunged at our team with unimaginable speed and ferocity. Chaos erupted as we struggled to defend ourselves against this formidable adversary. The creature's attack caught us off guard, and it inflicted injuries on several of our soldiers. Instinct and training kicked in, and we retaliated with a hail of gunfire. The bullets hit the creature, causing it to roar in pain and anger. But it wasn't enough to bring it down. Despite our efforts, the cryptid managed to escape by leaping into the sea, disappearing beneath the waves with an eerie, vanishing act. We rushed to the ship's deck, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature's retreat, but it was as if it had never been there. The ocean lay calm and undisturbed, leaving us to wonder if the encounter had been a mere hallucination. As a special forces team, we were accustomed to facing danger head-on, but this encounter left us shaken to our core. We knew we had encountered something beyond the realm of our understanding, a cryptid that defied all known laws of nature. When I was about 18, I was sitting in a blind after dark trying to trap owls with a couple other people, were falconers. We were about half a mile or so from the nearest road in a clearing in the woods. It was pitch black all around and we only had a red light on inside the blind. The blind is about 12 by 12 by 8. 
There's three small rectangular holes in each wall but no other windows or anything, and a closed door. All of a sudden, bright light is coming in from all the different sides of the blind at once. We all start quietly freaking out. My first thought was a police helicopter looking for drug growers, but there was no sound. As soon as it went dark, we ran outside and there was nothing around, and no sound. Can't explain that one, and I think I imagined it if I wasn't alone. A second one was a couple years ago. I was deer hunting in the mountains. I was walking up a trail, up to a peak in a fairly remote area. I left my car at around 4 am to start hiking. I could hear nosies in the woods most of the way up, but never saw anything, and that's not really unusual. When I was hunting, I saw two guys coming up the trail I had hiked in. I was just sitting looking through binoculars, so when they got close I waved and started talking to them. They asked how long I had been up there, and I told them, it was about 10 am at this point. Then they asked if I saw all the wolf tracks on the path. No. There hadn't been any wolf tracks. So, on the way back down, I was watching the trail, and starting about 100 yards down from the peak, I started seeing wolf tracks and scat. Some of them even in my boot prints. There was about 7 or 8 individuals, and the tracks overlapped mine starting right after leaving my car. Turns out they were what I had been hearing all the way up the mountain. That still freaks me out. It was an average summer day for us 10-year-olds in northern Illinois. It was a day just like any other before it. We saw the same people, we watched the same cars drive by, and we heard the same animals making the same noises they always make. There we were, the four of us, taking a break from playing basketball and for some reason, I looked up. There it was the biggest bird I had ever seen flying out of the western sky, but I wasn't sure it really was a bird. When I first saw it I was certain it was one of those custom-made biplanes that was just made to look like a bird. However, I noticed there wasn't any noise coming from its engines. That's when the beast's wings flapped. It was at that time I realized I was actually staring at a bird bigger than any I had ever seen in my life. I shouted at my three friends to look up, partly so they could see this giant bird and partly so I'd have someone to tell me if I was seeing things or not. At the time I wasn't sure if any of them did look up, my eyes were fixed on the bird. I continued to watch it as it flew over my house, then off into the eastern sky. The entire sighting was only about 30 seconds, but those 30 seconds were etched into my mind forever. The bird itself was probably around 6 to 10 feet in length. As for its wingspan, I am certain that it was at least around 25 feet, maybe bigger. It was a dark brown color with no other marks that I could see. One thing that stands out in my mind is its huge claws. I had seen both vultures and birds of prey's claws and something about these made me think of a bird of prey. The only part of the bird that I didn't get a good look at was its head. All I can remember seeing is its beak, and that was only for a brief moment. As for the other three witnesses, I am certain that two of them saw the bird too. As for the third one, he wasn't around when I looked to see if anyone else was present after the bird was out of my view. As for one of the other witnesses, at the time of the sighting, and for a while after it, he agreed that we saw a rather large bird, but a couple of months after the sighting he said he didn't remember seeing anything. As for the fourth witness, he has always agreed that we saw a giant bird that day. He remembers it being a dark color but isn't sure which color because the sun was in his eyes from his viewpoint. One thing we don't agree on about the bird is its size. He thinks it was slightly bigger, around 12 feet with the wingspan of about 30 feet. That sighting was 7 years ago, 1995, and to this day I am not sure what it was. I know it wasn't a vulture or a hawk of some kind, because I see those all the time around here. After reading about Thunderbirds I believe that is what it was. I just wish I could get a glimpse of it again, one then I can be certain if all I saw was my imagination taking over for a moment, or a truly massive bird roaming the midwestern skies. On February 27, 2023 my friend was driving home from work, and passing down my country road sometime between 5pm and 6pm less than a mile from my house, at the end of my township, Within 1,000 feet of the closest house, he saw an unknown creature. It was at the edge of the road as if it were about to cross. 
It was pitch black, very furry, and had a bob tail, and the face of a pit bull. I could see its jowls. It had dog-like ears, slender, but muscular, and was standing on all fours. When it saw me, it paid no attention to me, but slowly turned around and lipped back into the woods. When it left, it jumped like a frog. Its legs were turned out, just like a frog. It was appropriately the size of a Great Dane, on all fours. He was uncertain if it had humanoid feet, and couldn't identify much else. Where he reported having seen it in a wooded area, right beside a small bayou, southern Louisiana, and there is a notable nook that leads off into the woods right around where he saw it. The very same night after he saw it, I heard strange noises around midnight, akin to something climbing the wooden structure, thuds, and the sound of wood bowing. Side events, six or so years ago, I saw something strange leap between one section of woods to another, across a highway, about a half mile from my home. It was black, hairy, and ape-like at a glimpse. About three years ago, me and my wife heard a tapping on the window behind us, around midnight. We laughed about it at first, but my cousin from across the street called me moments after and said there's something big in your yard, I could hear it running through your yard. It's in the woods now. We investigated, and heard it rustling through trees, but never saw it. The next morning, outside the window that was tapped on, was a large humanoid footprint. Barefoot. To tap on the glass would require something to stand, upright, at least five feet minimum, given the lifted foundation. About three years ago, a buddy and I were hanging out, and we saw something strange walk into my cousin's yard, across the street. It was large, black, and furry. It walked on all fours and appeared like a pig at first glance. We scoped in on it, and couldn't determine what it was. It had a dog-like snout, but the stature and build of a hog. It was about the size of a large hog, or perhaps a large bear cub. I don't remember it having a tail. It sniffed around his house, circled it, and went back into the woods. About a year ago, I was driving at night from the far end of my road. There is a curve approximately a half mile from where my friend reported seeing the creature. In the curve, as I banked a bit, my headlights shined into the woods and revealed I shine, about six feet off the ground. I stopped the car next to where the eye shine was, to examine it. I didn't see anything else, but the smell of rotting meat flooded the car, and I promptly left. About a year ago, I was outside around midnight, when I heard a strange noise in my cousin's yard. I shined a flashlight over there and caught some eye shine at average height from the ground. It looked at me and kept walking into the wood line. In my experience, if you spotlight something and can see its eye shine, they stop and stare at you. This thing kept going, but watched me the whole time. I continued to shine into the wood line for a bit longer, and it returned, about 15 feet down the wood line. It stared at me from within the woods and turned around. I continued to shine my light and caught it one more time in the same place as the second encounter. It looked at me for a moment and turned away. I didn't see the eye shine again. At the time, I had an eerie feeling that it seemed too sentient to be a deer or a hog. Maybe a big cat, but no normal woodland critter from around here. I grew up in a very rural area. As a kid, I'd do a lot of exploring. Once when I was about 11 and my brother was 8, we were riding our bikes down an old trail on the edge of our neighbor's property. We frequented abandoned dirt roads often, so we knew if we just kept following the trail, we'd eventually end up at the main road, about a quarter of a mile from our driveway. We came across an old red iron lean-to. There were cow carcasses hanging from the top post in various states of decay. This spooked us and we got out as quickly as possible. We really didn't speak about it after that but both still explored. I had found a house when I was about 16 or so but never had the courage to go in. It was about two miles behind our neighbor's 22-acre property line. I didn't really worry about it because of how far and I didn't want to go that far out on someone else's land like that again. Now here's where it gets weird. At 22 me and two other friends got drunk and decided to go exploring. I knew how to get to this house because there's a trail. It's overgrown from years of neglect but it's still a viable trail. We get to a clearing and there's the house. There is a rusted 50s oil cup truck parked beside the home. It's white wood and still in pretty decent condition. 
The lawn was short of gras, almost like it was fresh cut and it looked like they needed to weed eat around the truck and house. I didn't think much of this at the time. We don't plan to go in at first. We walked around the back and saw there was a whole trailer behind the house. The two were connected by a crudely made awning and porch. We could see the back door of the house and the front door of the trailer were both open. One quart glass jars were everywhere. I mean dozens. Some on the ground under the porch, a lot on the platform. There were so many, they spilled out of the trailer and house. Most were empty but some had a clear liquid. We decided not to enter the trailer because that seemed to be where the majority of the jars were. We were unsure of broken glass and assumed the liquid was moonshine as it wasn't growing algae like some of the others. We go through the back door and find the house was in disarray. Paper everywhere, tons of water damage. The roof and floor were caving in in some places. I found a calendar from 1973 hanging. Old toys and books were just scattered. No seating or bedding furniture but there were a couple of tables and a desk. The craziest thing I found was a box within that desk. It contained pencils, blank papers, a how to write in shorthand book and some records. The records showed large sums of money being paid not only to the local school but also to several people. The area I grew up in is a lot of old money, generational wealth people and I recognized many last names. One of the names I recognized was my 70-something year old and lords. The sums of money were anywhere between 50 and 6,000. The larger amounts were paid to the school and frequently too. They get a check at least once every week, sometimes twice a week never for less than 1,000. At this point, one of my friends found a plate and glass on the kitchen table. It was dirty like it had food on it at one point. There were dirty dishes in the sink too. This kinda weirded us out so we left at this point. It's been about 10 years since that day. A few weeks ago, I'm shooting the shit with my dad at about 2 in the morning. We were talking about living there for so many years and how we had so many memories. With it being so late, I felt a little spooky so I told him about the house. I did not tell him about the Resiex. After hearing my story he kinds nods and says, yeah, that's Mr. Cup's house. I had never heard of this dude in the 20 something years I've lived in this house. The more I got to thinking about it, the more I felt like I remembered that name on the records. I asked my dad how he knows about the house and apparently, when we were little kids, my parents had too much to drink one night and took some of their friends out there to go ghost hunting. He saw pretty much the same thing I did. He told how he gets to the location and I realized the road I found those carcasses on as a kid was one of Mr. Cup's driveways. The other came out about a quarter of a mile to the opposite of my house. I then told him about the Resieps and our now deceased original landlord's name on them. He tells me he doesn't know about all the Resieps but he does tell me that way back in the 50s, Mr. Cup and our landlords where it ends about where the property line was. Mr. Cup had proof of his side of the land. The landlord had filed a motion to stall the lawsuit and eventually, after years of fighting, it was settled that the property Mr. Cup was living on was theirs. Some of the details in regard to why Mr. Cup didn't get his land are fuzzy to my dad. He does know that the landlords didn't tell Mr. Cup Tai he had to vacate because they didn't want him to appeal. So for about 10 years they let him live there and didn't mess with him. At this point, he's in his 70s and it's in the 1970s. The landlord gave Mr. Cup's property, in addition to a lot of property behind our neighbor's acreage to her daughter as a wedding present. They forced Mr. Cup to pay them in order to stay. The daughter used the money to fund a clubhouse in the middle of the property. They also redirected his access road, the trail, to lead to the clubhouse. This went on for some time until the couple who are now in possession of the property decided to divorce. The guy was the brother to my little brother's best friend's dad. His family home was right down the road from all this. He managed to win all the property in the divorce and the wife got the money. The first thing he did was go to Mr. Cup and sold him not only his property back, but also all the property that was originally the landlord's, including the property the club was on. So Mr. Cup closed off all access to the club and the access point furthest from him. He left the one closer to his home open. Then what? I had asked my dad. He shrugged. Nothing, he lived a few more years and then died. They found him at the kitchen table a few months after he had passed. 
I don't know who owns this property now, nor do I know who has been maintaining it. The only other person in this area with that last name spelled it different and was not originally from the area. I know nothing else about it. I don't even know what was in those jars. I think about this sometimes and the more I think about it the more questions I have answers. I saw an alien in my room and showed them a meme. I wrote this account six months ago because I needed to get this story off my chest. This experience was starting to affect my relationship and I desperately needed to tell someone and move on. I decided not to go through with posting about it because I didn't want to seem cringe or have a bunch of people tell me that I was lying. Fast forward to today and I'm finally feeling brave enough to share. Context, I'm female, I was 22 at the time and in my last year of engineering school, still living in my parents' house. Since then I've moved out and got a job in another city. Back in April 2022 I was laying in bed relaxing and had drifted off to sleep around 1am, I'm a night owl and typically stay up well into the night. Sometime after I fell asleep I was awakened by someone grabbing me from behind in an awkward hugging motion. Like a bear hug but more awkward than grabby. I slept on my side and would usually face the wall, so I needed to turn around to see who was touching me. My mom usually gets up for work super early, so I assumed it was her coming into my room to hug me and say bye for the day. I was horribly wrong. When I started to turn around, my vision was still blurry, and I couldn't see anyone standing directly next to my bed. I was confused because I had just felt someone touching me. Before I had even finished fully turning to see, my eyes had wandered to the corner of my room near my desk, and my body froze immediately. There was this unknown being floating directly above my desk. I'm not even sure if being is the right word to use, but it looked humanoid. This being was slightly shorter than me, I'm 5 feet 3, had a larger than normal head, and a tiny slit mouth, and their skin was this blackish, star-speckled color. I don't even know how to describe it, but they almost looked airy, like if I poked them my finger would go right through. I felt like I was looking into some sort of cosmic gas. It was really strange, but the most prominent feature I noticed was their gigantic, deep black eyes. The eyes somehow managed to be a deeper black than their skin. They were so huge and just very striking to see. When I saw them hovering over my desk, I made eye contact and my whole body froze. My immediate instinct was to get up and run away, but it was like I couldn't move my arms and legs no matter how much I thought I needed to. I was frozen still. A strange detail I remembered the other day was that when I made eye contact, all the ambient noise in the room was gone. It was completely silent, and we were just staring deeply into each other's eyes. It was like time completely frozen at that moment. While I was staring into their eyes, I felt something I had never felt before. I felt the most primal fear I could have ever felt. I felt like I had suddenly reverted into a caveman or something. I felt this horrible dread, a horrible terror. I kept thinking that I needed to get up and run, I needed to get away, but I couldn't move. And then I heard this message in my head. I can't exactly describe how I heard it. It wasn't as if someone said it to me, but as if it was directly planted into my own thoughts. It said, don't be afraid, and I thought to myself what in the world is going on? I was confused because I heard this message but the being itself did not speak. Like their mouth didn't move, in fact, I don't remember any sort of facial expression ever being conveyed other than the creepy intense stare. I felt a sort of calmness wash over me and I blacked out a few moments after that. The next thing I remember is being seated at my desk. The being was gone but I could still hear these messages in my head. I'm assuming they realized how scared I was and decided to hide themselves to avoid me freaking out again. I can't exactly remember the entire conversation word for word, or how it even happened, but I remember the gist of it. Basically, I was shown these images of real life war, maybe the war in Ukraine? And images of war and things like cartoons and media, and I guess it wanted to know my opinions about both and the way the images made me feel. I can't remember my response but I remember feeling that they were mildly satisfied with it. For a moment I felt like there might have been a third presence in the conversation like someone else was observing, but I'm not completely sure. At some point during the encounter, I felt awkward and I grabbed my phone to look online, just looking for something to calm myself down. 
Nobody was in the room but still, I felt like I was being watched intensely. It's worth noting that I have very severe social anxiety and I was scared, but I didn't feel like I was in danger anymore. Anyway, I ended up finding some stupid meme and laughing at it, and I got a feeling like the being was questioning my behavior like they seemed intrigued by the way I was acting. I remember holding my phone up in the air like look. Not knowing where they were but trying to show them anyway. There was a moment of silence, and then the next thing I know I was back in bed again like nothing ever happened, in the blink of an eye. My phone was lying next to me on the bed, and the screen was off. I grabbed it to look at the time. It was like 3 or 4 am. I checked my tabs to make sure I wasn't insane, and sure enough, the last page that I had been on was still open. I don't think they liked my meme. After this happened, I felt like I had been severely traumatized. I slept with a light on for several months after this happened. I talked about it constantly, so much so that I started to overwhelm my girlfriend with my behavior. I was paranoid all the time, I couldn't fall asleep without checking that same corner over and over again. I spent months researching other people who've had similar encounters, just trying to convince myself that I'm not crazy. I still do feel paranoid a lot of the time, and sometimes I convince myself that it wasn't real and I was just dreaming, sleep paralysis, but my body knows the truth. I still feel that horrible dread feeling when I think about what happened, especially when I think of looking into their eyes. My hands will shake and I start to sweat, my body goes numb. It's the only thing that keeps me 100% sure that it wasn't just a dream. I still find myself checking corners when I'm in bed at night, but it's gotten a lot easier to manage now that some time has passed. This experience has completely changed the way I see reality and consciousness, and definitely made me ask myself some tough questions about our existence on this planet. It was late at night, around 11.30-11.45. Myself and a buddy were sitting at the fire talking when we heard a commotion on the other side of the creek about 15 yards from us. It sounded like a very large animal was rolling down the embankment towards the creek. We heard a howling sound and short grunting noises coming closer and closer. Now here I must tell you that I have just listened to a few of the audio clips on this site in the clip titled Westmoreland Moans has got the hair on the back my neck standing on end, it is the exact same sound. At first we thought it was a coyote with a really strange howl, but there was no answer in the distance from another in response. The sound came closer and closer until we could hear splashing in the creek 15 yards away. All of a sudden a deer came bolting through our camp, surprising the heck out of us, then we sat down and laughed it off. But it wasn't over. We could hear something still on the other side of the creek breaking branches and twigs. We caught a faint odor, like that of an extremely dirty dog, then came the moan again and splashing around in the water. I had brought my .22 rifle with me and took the opportunity to fire a few rounds into the air. We heard a horrible grunting sound and then we could hear it going back up the embankment on the other side of the creek. Terrified, we hopped into the truck, but didn't leave. I aimed my headlights toward the other side of the creek to try to see anything. We saw nothing but could still hear loud grunts or snorts. We left for the evening and came back at daylight to retrieve the rest of our belongings. Driving into camp we could see that things had been moved around. We couldn't find any footprints, but did see branches broken and bent as high up as 9 to 10 feet. Since then I have returned only once to show a friend where it had happened. As I was walking very slowly trying to be as quiet as possible in the tender dry branches and needles I noticed movement about 75 yards down the slope from me. I started to raise my rifle but immediately noticed the animal I saw was dark brown or black in color. My thoughts immediately processed that it was a bear but then it was very apparent the animal I was looking at was on two legs. I was in disbelief of what I was seeing. I raised my rifle to look through the scope but the animal was walking very briskly through the woods as if it was on roller skates, very fluid movements. I watched it for about 15-20 seconds as it changed direction away and down the slope from me. It had started towards an open meadow but then turned and headed down the slope through the trees. Later that night after I had recounted my experience to the others in our party we experienced noises coming from either side of the meadow where we were camped. At first there was a loud crack from one side, after a few moments there was a loud crack from behind our camp. 
We thought it may be a herd of elk in the timber and shined a light into the dark to see what we could see but there was nothing. We experienced the same types of sounds and experiences, the sound of large branches cracking from either side of our campsite, two more times over the next hour. This happened probably five or six years ago, I think I was 18 at the time. For starters, I lived in a city where neighborhoods and forests kind of blend together. There are plenty of wooded areas where people go to have bonfires and parties. One night, after discovering that all of our usual spots were crowded with people, I suggested we go to a spot that I had been to a few times nearby. I had been there multiple times, but only during the day. The street where we park is maybe 200 feet from the tree line, it's your average middle class neighborhood, nothing crazy is really known to happen there. So we walk in, start a bonfire and we're all having a good time. Some of us are drinking and smoking a bit, myself included. About 45 minutes pass and I'm a little intoxicated, but nothing major. And over the sound of our quiet music and my friends talking, I hear something odd. I can't make out what it is so I figure maybe I'm just hearing things. Maybe another 10 minutes go by and I hear it again, a little better this time. It still sounds relatively far away but it sounds like velcro tearing. I stop and just kind of sit there trying to listen while my friends carry away laughing and talking. They haven't seemed to notice. And that's when I heard a sound I was very familiar with. A zapping noise, like you hear from a taser. Very brief, but unmistakable. My stomach drops, and I started looking around a little frantically. My girlfriend at the time was the first to notice my distress. She asks me what's wrong and I explain and she immediately starts worrying. She gets my friends to quiet down and we all just sit there and listen for a bit. Then we all hear it. An electric zap. Brief again, but we all know that sound. We all start panicking a bit and we quickly put out the fire while asking each other what the F that was or where exactly it was coming from. We're all scared to walk out, it's only maybe a 5 minute walk to the street but it's dark. We all muster the courage to finally walk the path out and we don't run into anyone. We finally get to the street and start walking to our cars, nervously laughing and relishing being under street lamps again. I see him first. He's walking towards us, not at us, just walking in the direction we just came from. Slightly to the right of us. He's holding a stick of some sort. It scared me at first, but for a brief second I calmed myself. It was a pretty safe neighborhood that I knew really well and it was really common to see people out walking at night. But then I notice he's looking right at us. That stare is burned into my mind. We pass each other, my friends and I are all silent as we're having this stare down with this random man. And that's when it happened. He doesn't break eye contact, holds up the pole and smiles this creepy smile. His eyes are open so wide. The end of the stick lights up bright and that same zapping sound happens again, much louder this time. He's holding a cattle prod. We live in a city, no farmland nearby, no reason to have a cattle prod. My friends and I are silently shitting ourselves as he walks past us, maybe 20 feet away and goes straight into the woods without a flashlight or anything. We all got into our cars and peeled out of there. We never went back to that spot. I'll share my encounter on US-20 at Tapley Woods of a dog man over roadkill which I documented with another reporting site. Late evening on a weekend trip to see my parents in Galena, Illinois. Five minutes from Tapley Woods State Natural Area, Illinois, driving my cargo van 45 to 50 miles per hour past the rest stop slash hunting registration area exit. On the north of the road going west, I noticed a dark figure stooping over roadkill. It was jet black. When our eyes met, its white burning evil glare shook my soul in absolute fright and knowledge this was not just an animal but demonic. I gunned my old van to the limit as I feared it would chase me because I could feel the stare from the passenger door rear mirror. I pick up two invasive thoughts, leave and forget. In five minutes, I was at my parents' home and went to the guest room, closing the shades of a floor to ceiling window right next to my bed. I did not think of that experience until I saw an artist's depiction of a canine variant with three all black and burning white eyes. 
Later I found another account from an elderly couple, the black white-eyed wolfman had run across the road in front of them driving at night on Blackjack Road in the same Joe Davies County, not more than 20 miles away, 125 miles from the famous Beast of Bray Road incidents. My brother, who works for the FBI, has also lived in the area with his wife and has said the property security found a dead deer 20 feet in a tree. I think only African leopards stash their prey in trees but nothing does that in North America? I suppose a car could hit something that hard but the winding roads would never let you get up that speed and no reports of a crash. After that, in the winter, 500 feet before a convenience store on the road, I saw a giant all-black dog or a wolf. It crossed very casually even though my muffler is a bit loud. I caught up with security just ahead of the wolf and asked if he saw that monster canine in its rearview mirror. No, he said. I googled if wolves were seen in Illinois at that time. Only once in 50 years and if it was a dog there are strict leash laws and fines who would let that out. My father and I spent some time camping along Highway 49 in California's Gold Country at a campsite that was on the Merced River arm of the lake where not many people ventured out to. On this particular trip us, some guy prospecting his mining claim, and a conversion van that just sat about one campsite over were the only occupants at the campground. Halfway through our trip someone is banging on our trailer door at 2 a.m. As if that isn't creepy enough, and it turns out to be the sheriff asking if we had noticed anything in particular about the van sitting two sites over. Somewhat freaked out, we told him no and went back to sleep. The next day we inquired with a campground ranger who told us the guy was three days late. Checking out then he called the sheriff who found a deceased man in the van. Turned out to be natural cause, so we finished our camping trip, but it still creeps me out knowing I was going about my business all weekend mere feet from a dead person. I used to work for my brother doing landscape work on foreclosed houses. Usually we just mowed the lawn so it didn't get out of hand and the house looked at least decent to anyone who might want to buy them. In some cases we would have to clean leftover stuff out of them as well. Eventually my brother would send me out on my own for the simple lawn care cases or to take pictures of newly foreclosed houses so the banks could assess what needed to be done. In this particular case I was sent to a new house in the town beyond the deliverance s town in my area. After the 45-minute drive out through a heavily forested area I arrived to take exterior and interior pictures. I take the exterior shots no problem, however, when I put the key in the door to go inside the door just opens and I'm hit with a cold, musty air and hear something scurry upstairs. Needless to say I turned around and deemed the house unsafe to enter with the bank more for there might be someone squatting in their danger than danger from damage to the house. For some reason before I left I took a picture of the house with my phone and it always creeped me out when I saw it. I used to go camping a lot and had a weird experience out in the woods. My then boyfriend and I were camping with some friends on a large piece of privately owned property inside a national forest. One of our friend's family owned the land, but nobody lived there full time. The property was partially cleared and the cleared acreage had a trailer house, barn, equipment shed, well house, etc. It was surrounded by a barbed wire fence to keep their cattle in, and a gravel road ran along the inside of the fence line. Their property extended outside the fence, into uncleared forest, and merged with forestry service land. We camped at the fence line. We were told not to cross the fence by ourselves, and stay in the cleared area to be safe. Most of the people in our friend group were from the city and not accustomed to the forest. My boyfriend, me, and a friend of his who didn't have a tent were sleeping in my tent. I had the nylon flaps all open to let air flow through the mesh windows because it was a warm night. I was laying on an air mattress next to the back window, facing the fence and forest. I woke up in the middle of the night, feeling like someone was up and about. But I listened and didn't hear any of my other friends out of their tent. Something moving in the forest caught my eye. It was a dark human shape slowly peeking out from behind a tree and I assumed looking at the camp. It would lean away from the tree, then slowly duck back behind it. It was all dark, from head to where the legs disappeared into the low underbrush. I couldn't see clothes, a face, a flashlight, or anything. Just a dark human shape. 
I watched it long enough to convince myself that it wasn't a shadow, and turned over to wake my boyfriend up and tell him I think somebody is out in the forest. He looked out the window but only saw some movement off in the trees, and I couldn't spot it again either. He had me switch places with him so he was next to the window and we went back to sleep. The next day, nobody from our group admitted to being out of their tents overnight. It couldn't be a neighbor. They were few and far between, and likely wouldn't trespass. Same with a camper or hiker. Public areas of the forest were too far away. I have no idea what I saw. But it was really weird. This happened fairly recently. About six months ago, my brother, mother, Anne and I were driving home from my grandparents' house. It was about 9 p.m. and we were driving down a very long road that stretched for miles on end. At this point of time we couldn't see anything without our headlights so they were on the brightest setting. As we were driving down this road we suddenly heard what seemed to be a motorcycle revving next to us. But as we looked out of our windows we saw nothing. This noise kept fluctuating getting louder and quieter as we kept going down the road. This noise dragged out for another 5 minutes as we were trying to figure out where it came from. We turned off the radio, opened and closed the windows and even stopped the car to only still hear this revving noise, and keep in mind there were no houses, cars, towns for miles. We still haven't figured out where the noise came from and haven't heard it since. We still talk about this paranormal occurrence to this day as a reminder to never drive down that road at night again. When I was a kid I lived in Clinton, Tennessee. Both parents worked full time, so I was often sent over to stay with my grandparents who had a plot of land in the vicinity of, but not right in, Mossheim, near Greenville. Both of them had been in East Tennessee for their whole lives, and that area for a good many years. They had been established at their home for some decades before this story and remained there a good time after. Recently, I had reason to return to that area of Tennessee after having spent the majority of my adult life in Minnesota. Being in and around the area, driving the same roads made me reminiscent about my lazy summer days tucked away at my grandparents. Learning to shoot on the same point .22 with which Grandpa had taught Mom, eating fish at a neighbor's stock pond, or spotting deer and bear with binoculars from the back porch, when I relate this to my mom, she in turn told me a story about a time I scared my grandpa half to death and lied about hanging out with Bigfoot. At first I had no idea what she was on about. Then I remembered exactly what actually happened with startling clarity. New context given by the experience adulthood provides. And no, this is not about Bigfoot or cryptid. Before we start, some information about my grandparents' land. Their house was on a small hill surrounded by a grass lawn. The lawn gave way to a smallish hay field, then the wood line. Those woods lasted for a good half mile to either side of the home, and a good several miles to the back. I hated the hay field because it was too pokey to play in, but liked to hang out in a creek that ran behind it. To get there I would walk to the edge of the property just in the wood line to avoid the hay. While at my grandparents the only rules were that I stay where I could see the house, so the house could see me. I was to take a whistle with me anywhere I went went. I didn't take the whistle, seeing it as a badge of my regrettably young age. And the best part of the creek was out of sight of the house. That was the only stretch where it got deeper than my knees, and thus the only part where I could swim. Naturally, I spent much of my time in that water splashing around, skipping stones, and being a kid. One day I was playing in the creek when I noticed someone. It was a man, a stranger, on the bank watching me. He had long hair, a beard and pale skin so dirty it was stained. I could not tell his age and simply thought of him as old. I have no better guess now, as he clearly went through long years of hard living. He wore no shirt on, 
no pants, only a wrap of dirty cloth around his waist that I thought of as a Moses dress thanks to some illustrated Bible stories. Around his neck there were multiple necklaces made from knotted tatters of cloth, fiber, and string. In those knots were various pieces of detritus, mostly bones, but some flowers and bits of dark glass. When I first saw him there by the creek I was terrified. Terrified. Frozen still. The man, however, was smiling. He gestured from his squad with an outstretched arm, fingers down, and a kind of don't stop for me wave. I didn't react, startled and reeling. Then he splashed at me, still smiling. He did it again. I splashed back. And soon we were playing. We both threw water at each other. He jumped into the creek and stomped around with me, laughing all the while. He threw rocks into the water and so did I. I pushed him, he pushed me back. We carried on for some minutes until my grandma called for me. With her voice a switch had turned off. The man stopped and his tracks gaze fixed back toward the house. Then as my grandma kept on hollering, he looked to me. He crept back to his side of the creek barely disturbing the water, then slid into the brush, completely silent the whole way. Holding my gaze. Once he was out of sight I waited in the water until my grandma found me. She wanted to know if I was alone. I said no. She became very tense asking who was with me while looking around. I didn't answer, didn't know how. Seeing no one, she pulled me back to the house without any more words, gripped like iron the whole time. At the house the real inquisition began. I didn't really have new words, the event in this reaction overwhelming my ability to explain. Such silence further irked my grandma and I was swiftly placed in a corner, held without bail, awaiting patriarchal judgment. Around an hour later my grandpa came home from work. He was told about my churlishness and was ready to set into me again when I started talking. I told him about the man, hairy and old dressed like Moses. About how we played then he disappeared. I remember they digested this for a few minutes before sending me to my room. I was happy to go, and happier still Grandpa did not yell like he usually did when misbehaved. Later I was brought out for dinner. I ate in the kitchen with Grandma, but Grandpa called me to the back porch. He was on the swinging bench, looking out over the hayfield turned red by the setting sun. He had kicked off his boots and put them next to his shotgun. I knew that was odd for the gun to be out of the closet. Previously, we had used it to shoot bottles, some I wouldn't throw them into the air like they were clay pigeons. These escapades were accompanied with speeches about how the gun was dangerous and only for adults to use. He went through my story again. His tone deadly serious. Eventually he asked me how Harry was the man, really. I told him very, thinking this was the right answer. He asked where, I told him everywhere like a bear. He ruminated on this and I grew more nervous. Worried I was in trouble, or causing trouble, just wanting the trouble, wherever it lie, to end. So when he finally asked me to swear, in the name of Christ and on my mother that I was telling the truth about everything, I said I had been joking. He finally yelled then, and sent me back to my room. The family memory became that I had hit by the creek and made up a tale about Bigfoot. At the time everyone was very upset with me and I was forbidden from going back to the creek or anywhere out of sight. The enforcement of this rule, like the others, was lackluster. Even so, for a time I didn't go to the creek. In my memory I stayed away for a very long time, but I am sure it was only a few days, that hiatus feeling interminable to my elementary aged self. When I did start going to the creek, I took a bucket of toys, mostly Godzilla, and a thick stick plucked from the wood line on the way. I think I was conflicted about what to do if the man came back, imagining either impressing him with my toy collection or clubbing him. Or both in turn. When he did show back up, 
He appeared next to me as I dozed under a tree on my side of the creek. I was once again gripped with terror. He was not smiling. His face expressionless as he lurked beside me, having watched for who knows how long before I smelled him. I scrambled away leaving behind my stake and toys. Coming to my feet a yard out, I stood in the sun while the man watched me from the shade. Eventually he crouched and started to look through my bucket. I remember becoming indignant as he examined my toys one by one only to toss them into the dirt. It became too much and I started to lecture the man, telling him about how he got me in trouble, how he was a weirdo, how he stank. At some point he stopped looking through my things and calmly watched my tirade. Face still neutral, eyes analytic. Once I had concluded my lecture I sat back under the tree to pout, having become hot in the sun. I remember the man made a noise, a grinding kind of snort, and when I looked over at him, he was chuckling while he inspected the last few figures in my bucket. I wanted to laugh too, but was more determined to stay sullen. Once everything was out of the bucket to put one figure, Ghidorah, back into the bucket. He then stood to his hunched fullest, took the bucket by its handle, began to make his way back into the woods. I stayed by the tree until he turned, said something, not a word I knew or know, and gestured with a forward sweep of his hand. At first I didn't comply despite knowing he wanted me to follow. After a few moments he yipped, clicked his teeth, and gestured again more emphatically. With this further prompt, I did get up and come along, the man making approving noises and putting on his smile again. We went into the woods. The man lead, but he was naturally quicker and quieter making it hard to keep up. Eventually, he would stop when he lost me, knocking on trees with sticks and whistling arrhythmically so that I may find him in the vegetation. He never came back for me, opting instead to guide me forward with the noises. I became lost, having only a vague sense of my grandparents' place being behind me. After some time, maybe fifteen minutes we came to a bald. The man had me wait there, indicated by patting the ground, before going into the tree line alone. He returned from a different direction pulling a sled. It was made from half of a discarded plastic drum and lined with small pelts and smooth bark. On the back half there rested the fly-covered carcasses squirrels, opossums, and other critters savaged into anonymity. On the pulling in woven pouches were tied into place on it by the same eclectic cordage that made the man's necklaces. He put my bucket on the sled and tossed Ghidorah in a pouch. He then called me closer with a glottal noise and beckoning wave. I saw the sled's pouches held many odds and ends. Dried salamanders, mushrooms, metal bits, glass fragments. From one the man pulled a square made from bound together sticks, just big enough to slip over my wrist. From another he pulled a piece of fool's gold in a small shard of geo crusted with a bit of purple crystal. These he handed to me with an air of business and a few more utterings of nonsense. He then patted the group for me to sit again. I did so without much bewilderment, understanding we had traded the same as exchanging Pokemon cards at recess. I did not much miss Ghidorah anyway, as he was a bad guy. The bucket was a loss. In retrospect I think Ghidorah was chosen because his still gold scales resembled something valuable. The bucket for its obvious ability to hold things. The man came back in gesture for me to follow by slapping his thigh. I did this readily. During the hike back I tried to keep up and pay attention. I did so moderately well, having to be whistled over a few times. I did notice that our path was not straight. The man lead me one way and then another, making turns unneeded by the lay of the land. We eventually came out by the creek, but from a different approach than we had left. I could hear my grandma calling for me again, not from up on the hill, from out in the field. The man would not cross the creek, but pushed me to do so. I did, but did not go to my grandma. 
Instead I crept back to the house and around to the opposite side. There I laid the shrubs by our front door pretending to sleep I was found. I swore I had been there the whole time. When I was sent back to my room I placed my fool's gold, crystal, and charm in my bedside table for safekeeping. The next day I went back to the creek to pick up my toys. The man was not there. However throughout that summer he did visit me again to sit under the tree or throw rocks at the water or yammer softy to himself. I would bring snacks and candy to share and he would likewise give me stringy dried meat which I ought not to have ate or honeysuckle blossoms which I still would eat taken from my old bucket. He seldom visited long and never splashed and whooped like he did on that first meeting. At this point you may be wondering why I have posted to Backwoods Creepy and not Backwoods Weird Youth Holes in the Woods. Well there are two more occasions I wanted to account. One gruesome, one awful. The eventful one occurred near the 4th of July. I had brought two boxes of bang snaps to the creek. The man was initially wary of the little fireworks, but quickly came to appreciate their miniature pyrotechnics. He took the box I gave him gratefully. Even taking the empty box, likely for the wood shavings which are excellent tinder. During the use of the bank snaps I had scared a turtle into the water into the opposite bank. It sat there watching us from the far shore. The man, after stowing the bank snaps in the bucket, noticed the turtle. With little thought he scooped up a smooth stone and threw it with force and accuracy into the turtle. He then waded over to retrieve the slider, which struggled meekly in his grasp, one leg knocked clean off. On the side of the river he took from the bucket a new piece of stone. One side was rounded and fit in his hand. The other came to a flinty cutting edge. Working with depth experience the man began chopping the live turtle above its neck, pulling up on the shell top. The thing struggled and bled as it was bisected. The dome eventually coming free, the turtle dropped to mingle its viscera with dirt and sand. The man rinsed the shell in the river then offered it to me. In wordless horror, I ran. That evening I came back to shuffle the dead turtle into the flowing waters of the creek. The shell itself was nowhere to be found. This experience did nor deter me from going to the creek or the man from visiting again. However, sometimes he would try to call me away from the creek with thumps and whistles. I would tell him I heard him and refused to move. On some occasions he would join me. On others he would leave. The last time we met we were sitting under the tree sharing cowtails. From the woods there came whistling and the staccato knocking of a woodpecker. The man looked up and whistled back. There were a few more such exchanges before he stood, collected his bucket, and beckoned for me to follow. I was curious and felt comfortable with the man as a guide, so I did as asked. He took me back to the bald. A direct path this time, periodically stopping to call or respond to the other in the wood. Waiting for us at the bald was a woman and a child. The woman was dressed the same as the man. Topless, wrapped at the waist. She was dirty, with long hair and a wiry frame. The child was in a similar state, wearing a sack that went to their knees. The man sat on the ground and the woman joined him, sitting in his lap partly in his lap but leaning forward so that her elbows rested on her crossed knees. She had dark brown eyes that were fixed to me. The other child would not look up. I didn't know what to do and didn't speak. The other kid lifted the sack to wipe at their nose and I learned under all that dirt they were a her. The man made a noise and drummed on woman's bare back. The kid looked at them, still hanging her head, hair covering her face. The woman yammered and swatted at the girl lazily. The man echoing her noises, slapping skin to skin once more. At this bizarre scene the girl approached me, stopping close enough I could smell her and hear her wheezing breath. She was thin, but not emaciated, and slightly taller than me should she have straightened up. The man and woman fussed some more, then the girl leaned close to me and pressed her cheek to mine. 
Her hair was in between us, greasy and cold. She made no move to embrace me, no move at all. Only pressing limply against me and breathing so loud it was all I could hear. During this time the woman had approached. She pulled the girl back by her shoulder with one hand and delivered a flurry of slaps to the crown of the girl's head. The woman then gathered the girl's hair in one hand, using the other to sweep back her bangs. The girl was then made to look at me, face bare. One side of her jaw was bulged out, smooth skin over a lemon-shaped bump. Her mouth was twisted by this deformity. Her nose faced to one side as if affixed sideways and leaked a trail of clear snot. One eye was bulged and rummy, the other startlingly regular. It looked at me, blank and dark brown. The woman gave the girl's head a little shake, spat off to the side, then cooed like a dove as she smiled at me. I ran. There was commotion behind me, I think the girl was pushed to the ground. I did not look back and they did not pursue. My flight ended at my grandparents' house, my absence unnoticed. I chose not to tell anyone what happened. Wanting to forget. Not wanting to get in trouble. Not thinking about the girl, the couple, what was intended for me. I spent that August inside whenever I visited my grandparents. I begged not to be taken, claiming it was boring and lonely. Sometimes, when I sat on the porch or went from the car to the house, I'd catch a snippet of bird call on the wind or the distant tapping of wood and hurry inside. My grandma could tell something was wrong and made an effort to entertain me in town. My grandpa cared in his own way, involving me in his errands as he never had before. Eventually school started. Classes and friends eased me away from thoughts of the dirty man or the people in the clearing. Time did the rest. I think now that all of the people in the clearing were of a family. But their features, white skin, brown eyes, brown hair, are common enough that they all could have been unrelated. I am sure they lived together. They knew each other's signs and signals. They used their own words. I know that the Smokies are full of tales of feral people, wild men men, and superstition. I also know that they are full of people living in unlikely ways in unlikely places. And that those real people call others kin. And that through the chain of human connection even a recluse living in a rundown shack is someone somebody. I guess I am asking if the people in my story are somebody's someone. Or if they are known. Or if their behavior rings any bells, or lies any known intention. I figured here, where the tale would not be discounted out of hand, might be the right place to ask. I live in a small town, around 7,000 people, in the suit of Sweden so it's still kinda secluded, especially at night. I still cannot explain what me and my friends saw. The thing about our town is that it gets very quiet close to midnight. This particular night I followed my friend home since she lives in a bad area, time was around 22.30. As usual the only sound was our footsteps and the occasional car passing, about one every ten minutes or so. Me and my friend were talking about life when everything went very quiet, I could clearly hear my own breathing. This made both me and my friend stop and have a look around. We were standing in the middle of a schoolyard when we saw a bright light. At first we thought it was a firework or something, but it made no sound at all. It moved past us at roughly 30 km an hour, around 5 meters off the ground. Flew in a straight line before it reached a couple of trees where it sped up and flew away out of sight, still silent and in a straight line. I've tried looking up what it could have been and the closest I've come to finding out is that the ball, roughly the size of a football, was a ball lightning. I'm still not sure since it was a clear winter night, we rarely have thunderstorms in the winter. The ball didn't have any lightning striking out from it either, it was just a bright white light floating in a straight line, completely silent. I have lived in southern New Jersey all my life, 
and naturally have heard all the stories about the Jersey Devil. I haven't believed all of them, but I do believe that the Jersey Devil, or something cryptid, is out there. In the summer of 2006, some friends of mine and I took a ride to the Pine Barrens, about a 30 minute drive. We weren't looking for anything in particular but were hoping we would see something along the lines of proof of the existence of the Jersey Devil. We were on Bowtown Road, near Bastow Village where we had heard of a lot of sightings and some strange things going on around there. As we were driving we passed by an old abandoned house and thought nothing of it. After a while of not seeing much aside from deer and an occasional owl, we decided to turn around. As we went by that old house, we saw what appeared to be bright green eyes peering out a window. Armed with just flashlights, we began to drive up to the house, but then the eyes disappeared. Next, a noise caught the attention of me and my friend who was in the front seat with me. She shone her flashlight in time for us to see something swoop over the car. By the time we could react to it, nothing was around. We went outside to investigate, but all that could be found were hoof prints in the sandy soil. The prints were too big to be deer and too small to be horse. As far as what swooped over the car, it was dark in color but was large, larger than any bird that I know of. I've been a part of many classified missions during my time in the Special Forces, but one particular operation stands out as the most unsettling and inexplicable experience of my career. It was a mission that took us deep into a remote, dense forest, far removed from civilization, and into the very heart of the unknown. The forest was unlike any I had ever encountered before, a place of eerie silence and perpetual twilight. It was as if the very trees conspired to hold their breath, as if they were privy to secrets that the rest of the world was not meant to know. Our team moved through the dense undergrowth with the utmost caution, every footstep echoing ominously in the stillness. As we ventured further into the forest, unsettling occurrences began to unfold around us. Strange figures seemed to lurk in the shadows, just beyond the edge of our vision. They moved with an otherworldly grace, their forms shrouded in a surreal haze. At times, we heard whispers that seemed to come from nowhere, carried on the faintest breath of wind. On one fateful day, as the sun cast long shadows across the forest floor, we encountered the creature that would forever haunt our nightmares. It emerged from the depths of the woods, a monstrous apparition that defied all reason. The creature stood at an imposing height, probably about eight feet tall. Its body was a dark gray with hints of brown, and its presence exuded an air of primal menace. It had a mane of hair that resembled that of a male lion, albeit shorter around the body and legs. But the most unnerving aspect was the way it moved, upright on its back legs, like a grotesque fusion of man and beast. As the creature locked eyes with us, a primal instinct of fear surged through our ranks. We opened fire, bullets tearing through the stillness of the forest, but the creature was unfazed. It roared with a guttural fury that rattled our very souls, and with a speed that belied its size, it vanished into the wilderness, leaving us stunned and trembling. We searched the area where the creature had been, our nerves on edge, but there was no sign of it. It was as though the forest itself had swallowed the creature whole, leaving behind only the echoes of its chilling roar. In the aftermath of that encounter, our team was left shaken and bewildered. We questioned the very nature of the world we thought we knew. Was this creature a product of some secret experiment or a manifestation of the untamed wilderness? We may never know the answer. On July 11, 2020, at approximately 22 hours, in Skewkill Haven, Pennsylvania, my son and I were on top of the roof after observing the local fireworks show. The fireworks had ended five plus minutes prior to this. He was positioning his camera towards the constellation of the Big Dipper, Ursa Major, in order to photograph Comet Neowise. I noticed something moving. The object, 
as best as I can describe it, was the shape of a manta ray as you would see it in the ocean looking at its underbelly from below the creature. This object moved quite fast from right to left almost directly above us. My son then saw the object and turned attempting to photograph it. I lost sight of the object after only maybe three seconds of seeing it move, but he said he saw the object make a turn and backtrack toward where it came from before losing sight of it. We both described the object as almost translucent with no visible lights at all. Earlier I was flying my Typhoon drone to photograph the fireworks, so the size was similar, but moving much faster. I am unsure if the object was 300 plus feet above us, or higher and larger than the drone, though the speed tells me it was lower. Again this was not a drone or any type of aircraft. It made no noise and had no visible wings. The entire episode lasted maybe 3 to 5 seconds. By the way, I have been a police officer in this town for over 20 years. In the spring of 2009, I was sent to Chechnya with my platoon to fight the enemy using unconventional means. Our mission was to divert supply lines and gather intelligence by talking to villagers. I remember how rainy and foggy it was during that time of year. One night, while retrieving a cache of buried weapons, my team noticed some lights in the forest. We could see them with the naked eye, but they were quite far off. It appeared to be ten small lights, all moving erratically. I then noticed what sounded like voices or whispers. It sounded like two people speaking Chechen. It was very quiet at first, but it started to gain in frequency until it sounded like they were whispering right next to my ear. Soon, ten more voices joined in the whispering, all speaking at once. I began to panic, fearing that we had been made. I thought maybe the lights were a distraction, a common tactic used by Chechen soldiers, and we would be ambushed. My teammate and good friend Ivan suddenly started speaking loudly, as if he was trying to communicate with his father who had died two years earlier. He started to run towards the light, dropping his gun and his pack. I assumed that he had lost it or the enemy was playing with our minds. Fearing for my friend and worrying he might give up our position, I chased after him. Ivan just kept repeating, I'm coming, father. He was in a dead sprint running towards the light. As we got closer and the lights got bigger, I found it odd that I could make out no definition in them. Nobody or nothing was behind them. They just looked like lights floating in the air. That was strange to me, I recalled. Ivan now on his knees, arms at his side, was in front of a body of water, directly in front of the lights. He seemed to be in a trance, and despite my attempts, I couldn't believe what was happening before my eyes. My friend Ivan seemed to be in a trance, talking to his father in the strange lights in front of us, despite my attempts to snap him out of it. In that moment, my only concern was to avoid getting shot. Eventually, the commander arrived and looked at Ivan and the lights before muttering, the fairies have him. I had never considered anything paranormal before, and I didn't know what to make of it. Ivan eventually passed out, and when I looked back up from his body, the lights were gone. It was terrifying. We carried Ivan back to our original location, but he had no memory of what happened. It was like he was in a coma, and he couldn't remember anything from that day. The experience was extremely weird, and it's the strangest event that ever happened in my entire life. Looking back, I believe that the lights had sinister intentions for us, possibly trying to lure Ivan to the water to drown him. The next day, we just nodded at each other and carried on with the missions. In the end, I became disenchanted with the Russian military and exchanged important information with U.S. officials. As a result, I was granted citizenship and now live in the U.S., having cut off all ties with my family. I have resumed my career as an infantryman, now as an American. A 
A friend and I were walking up the Fandon Trail and about 100 yards into it I saw what appeared to me as a Bigfoot impression right in the middle of the trail. There was no doubt as to what it was and as my friend caught up with me I asked him if he saw what I saw. There was no doubt in his mind of what he saw seeing either. The print was about 14 to 16 inches long but what impressed me was the width which was about 6-8 inches just below the toes. We walked about a mile up and continued to see these prints. I was armed with a .45 automatic and my friend with a 9mm so we felt safe but continued slowly with no smells or incidents. After about a mile I noticed another set of prints only smaller come right into the trail this kind of made my friend and I a little more nervous. About 20 feet later a third set appeared. This set was a little smaller than the second but we were sure that it was a third. At this time we decided to turn back. We smelled nothing, heard nothing but felt as if there was a presence that knew we were there. I had woke up early in the morning to use the restroom. When I went to step back into my room I noticed something in my window staring at me. It was dark in the room and my window was wide open without a screen. This was also a trailer house which had higher windows than most homes. I seen a reddish orange reflection of two eyes looking at me. After a second of trying to see what it was I realized it wasn't anything I've ever seen before. I stood in the hallway with this animal staring at me for what felt like 30 seconds but was more like 5-10 seconds before I had enough courage to scream. I was so scared I couldn't move or scream. This thing had to have been 7 half feet tall. I measured it from the ground up to the window where the top of the head would have been. This home is kinda out in the hills and is a forested area with a lot of rabbits and there was also a grapevine about 3 feet from my window. This image has never left my mind and when I talk about it, it makes that fear come over me again. I know what I saw and would take a lie detector test to prove what I saw, and I do believe it was a Bigfoot. It's 3.43 am in Tempe. My friend and I often like to explore parks late at night slash early in the morning. Tonight, we went to Papago Park. From the moment we arrived, there was a car parked but no one in the car. We thought maybe somebody was sleeping but upon quickly glancing, we didn't see anybody so we went to the park. From the moment we stepped out of the car, I saw a tall, lanky, humanoid looking. Something. I thought it was a person, but after blinking it disappeared. My friend then saw the same figure, except black, a short distance from where I had spotted it. We figured our minds were just playing with us so we went and decided to swing. The whole time we heard rustling around us. She started to get nervous, so we started walking back to my car. I could see a small black figure pacing quickly, almost running, back and forth between the trees. We were talking about it amongst ourselves when the car alarm went off. We booked it from my car and got in. As we drove away, there was still no sight of any actual person in the car or park. I went the wrong direction when we started leaving so I had to do a U-turn and as I drove away we could see the figure again pacing between trees. We were so freaked out that we stopped at a gas station, where I'm writing this, to google what it could have been. Does anybody have any clue what we may have seen tonight? My brother-in-law and his friend were sharing a tent when they joined us in camping for the weekend. When they woke up, they immediately questioned us as to who was walking around messing with them that night. He looked at me first, but I slept all night, as did my brother and my father. They then were very confused as to what it could be, because they said that something with massive rough hands grabbed their feet, which were hanging out of the unzipped tent to allow for ventilation in the heat and pushed them aside and back into the tent. They were awake while this happened and immediately looked outside their tent and saw nothing. They zipped up their tent and couldn't sleep all night. I was with two friends. 
We were sitting there on the rocks. It was getting dark. All of a sudden we started hearing rustling sounds. All of a sudden we started seeing figures moving around behind us. We were smoking cigarettes and I guess they must have been attracted to the smell. I thought it was cops with dogs. I don't know exactly how many figures there were but there were more than two. All of a sudden they stopped moving and sort of disappeared into the surroundings. We didn't know what to think. We were literally scared out of our wits so we just stood up and casually walked away. I have had numerous experiences by myself and with others in this park that corroborate this initial experience. The night was thick with tension as we stood on the precipice of the unknown. I was part of a team from the U.S. Special Forces, sent deep into the heart of a remote forest to confront a menace that defied understanding. It all began with a chilling tale of military experiments gone terribly wrong. In the heart of the forest, a clandestine laboratory had unleashed an unthinkable horror upon the world. Genetic experiments had given birth to monstrous abominations, creatures that existed only in the darkest corners of our nightmares. These entities, twisted by unnatural forces, roamed the forest with an insatiable hunger, preying on any unfortunate souls who ventured too close to their lair. We were not the first to confront this menace. A group of hikers, unsuspecting and unprepared, had stumbled upon the forest, unaware of the horrors that awaited them. Their terrifying encounter was a gruesome testament to the horrors that lurked within. The call had come in, and our team was dispatched to deal with the nightmare that had been unleashed. Our mission was clear, eliminate the creatures, close the laboratory, and contain the insidious threat that had escaped. The forest was an unforgiving maze, its depths concealing the horrors that lurked within. Armed with advanced weaponry and a steely resolve, we advanced cautiously, our senses sharp, every rustle of leaves and snap of twigs echoing through the forest, sending shivers down our spines. The creatures emerged from the shadows, grotesque and nightmarish. They were twisted and deformed, a fusion of biology and unbridled madness. But our training had prepared us for the worst, and we engaged them with a determination born of necessity. In the heart of the battle, we fought against the unnatural horrors, each moment a test of our resolve and courage. The forest became a battlefield, and the night was filled with the roar of gunfire and the guttural cries of the creatures. As the night wore on, we pushed deeper into the forest, hunting down every abomination that crossed our path. The creatures, for all their monstrous strength, could not withstand the coordinated onslaught of trained soldiers. Finally, we reached the source of the horror, the laboratory hidden deep within the forest. We destroyed it, ensuring that the experiments that had created these monstrosities would never happen again. With the laboratory in ruins, we knew that the threat had been contained. Our mission was a success, and the forest, once a place of unspeakable terror, was freed from the grip of the unknown predator. As we stood among the ruins of the laboratory, we knew that we had done what was necessary to protect our world from the horrors of unchecked science. Our mission had been a grim one, but we had faced the darkness and emerged victorious. The laboratory was no more, the creatures were eradicated, and the forest was at peace once more. Our duty was fulfilled, and we left the forest, knowing that we had closed the chapter on a nightmare that should never have been. While performing the Queen's Guard duty at Windsor Castle in the UK, we guards have our own time to relax after the castle closes to the public. During the night, there have been a couple of occasions where the faint sound of an organ could be heard emanating from inside an unoccupied part of the castle. These occurrences happened when there were no royals in residence, and despite police officers and guards searching the premises, nothing was ever found. There are also stories of a soldier who tragically took his own life in the rear gardens decades ago. Many claim to have seen his ghostly figure standing in windows at night, although personally, 
I haven't witnessed such sightings. Additionally, being on guard duty at the Tower of London can be incredibly eerie, especially when patrolling alone at night. The feeling of being watched from every angle is quite unsettling. I had the opportunity to speak with a laid-off forestry worker who was enrolled in the Displaced Workers Program at Lane Community College. He had a remarkable story to share, one that sent chills down my spine. This encounter took place back in the early 90s, and it involved him and a co-worker embarking on a fishing trip. As they made their way up a rugged dirt road alongside a peaceful creek, they heard an unusual splashing sound that immediately caught their attention. Intrigued, they followed the noise until they emerged from the dense forest, and that's when they saw it, a Bigfoot, standing in the creek just about a hundred feet away. Time seemed to freeze as their eyes locked with the mysterious creature. They stood in awe, unable to comprehend the sight before them. It was a moment of intense curiosity mixed with fear. Without exchanging a word, they both knew it was time to retreat. Their hearts pounding, they raced back towards their pickup truck, navigating through the dense forest and up an embankment that led to the road. Adrenaline fueled their every step. The memory of that creature's piercing gaze fueled their determination to escape its presence. As he scrambled to climb into the truck, the worker couldn't resist stealing a quick glance down the embankment. What he saw chilled him to the core. The Bigfoot had followed them, its eyes fixated on their every move. It peered up at them, its large hand gently holding up a branch as if inquisitively studying them. The worker's mind raced with a mix of astonishment, confusion, and a touch of terror. How could something so seemingly mythical be standing there, observing them with such curiosity? With no time to ponder further, he hastily jumped into the safety of the truck, and together they sped away from that haunting scene. The memory of that encounter has stayed with him ever since, a constant reminder of the unknown and the mysteries that exist beyond our understanding. It's a tale he often reflects upon, wondering about the nature of that elusive creature and the secrets it holds within the depths of the forest. In sharing this extraordinary story, the worker left me with a lingering sense of wonder and a profound respect for the mysteries of the natural world. Sometimes, the most astonishing encounters happen when we least expect them, forever altering our perception of what is possible. I grew up listening to the eerie tales and legends that were woven into the very fabric of our small Irish village. One story that I still vividly remember is that of the widower and his late wife. In our village, there lived a couple who had a beautiful house but never had any children. The wife's death hit the husband hard, leaving him in a cloud of sorrow. She was buried far away, almost on the outskirts of another city. Yet, whispers began to spread that the wife was visiting her husband every night, even in death. Residents living near the widower's house reported a terrible stench in the early hours, accompanied by mournful moans echoing through the darkness. They claimed to have seen a decaying figure entering the house on several occasions. Fearful of what might happen, the neighbors warned the widower about the strange nightly visitor. He, however, denied experiencing anything unusual. Suspicions grew among the villagers, who believed that the widower was hiding a macabre secret relationship with his deceased wife. One fateful night, they saw the rotting woman, covered in mud and dressed in rags, wandering close to the houses before making her way to the widower's home. As dawn broke, the villagers found muddy footprints leading inside the house, yet the widower still denied the rumors. No one could ever prove that it was, indeed, the late wife visiting her husband. But the legend persisted, and it's said that after the widower passed away, the ghostly woman was never seen again. Stories like these are a testament to the rich folklore that makes Ireland so enchanting. From tales of gnomes, elves, and leprechauns, there is no shortage of strange and mysterious beings that capture our imaginations. 
As I've grown older, I've come to appreciate these stories even more, recognizing that there is far more to the world than what meets the eye. And though these tales may send shivers down our spines, they also serve as a reminder of the magic and wonder that lie just beneath the surface of our everyday lives.